Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 115 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, my good friends John Just Adams, Matt London, and Rob Bland will be stopping by to discuss the new Marvel movie, Guardians of the Galaxy. But first up, we've got an interview with Nick Harkaway, author of The Gone Away World and Angel Maker. His latest book, Tiger Man, presents an unusual take on the idea of a costumed superhero. And now, here's our interview with Nick Harkaway. All right, so we're here with Nick Harkaway. Welcome to the show. Hello. All right, and so your new book is called Tiger Man. So what's that about? Uh it's about a lot of things. I mean, in the in so plot terms, it's about a guy on an island who's been sent there very specifically to relax and told not to see any of the bad things that are happening there. Uh, and he makes he finds a friendship with a local kid who just wants him to see everything bad that's happening there. So he has an immediate problem. And uh, his way of resolving this ultimately is uh, to put on a, a, a sort of ad hoc superhero suit and try and do something about it in a way that can't be traced back to him. But it's not ultimately just a, a, a story about a guy putting on a suit. It's also about the friendship. And, and in fact, it's about basically it's about fatherhood. I was becoming a dad while I was writing this book. So when you say there are bad things, what sort of bad things are happening? Uh, well, what we've got is an island in the middle of the sea where uh, the uh, international community has decided there's a kind of legal gap. The island in legal terms just doesn't really exist. And so all around it has gathered a kind of uh, a fleet of uh, off the books shipping, which I've called the Black Fleet, um, which is data havens, deniable torture centers, interrogation rooms, uh, the kind of hospitals where you can get a kidney replaced, no questions asked, and you can even bring your own. Um, you know, it's just full of all the kind of worst things you can imagine. In fact, the the uh, the thing that I keep saying about it is that it's Moss Eisley. Nowhere will hmm. you find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. <laughs> Um, and so you mentioned the story concerns the friendship between uh, this man, Lester Ferris, and a character who's referred to as the boy. Uh, tell yep. us a bit more, a bit more about the boy. Uh, he's a, a local kid. He's uh, apparently an orphan, or at least you know no one can put their hand on his parents. And he's uh, extremely bright, and he's obsessed with comic books and internet stuff. And his English reflects that. He speaks a kind of mixture of exactly the kind of mixture that you get if you spend a few hours surfing. You know, on the one hand, you're suddenly reading sort of a piece by Lawrence Lessig, and on the other hand, you're kind of, you know, if, if you're playing World of Warcraft at the same time, you can easily end up talking to, you know, a kind of kid in Shanghai or whatever, who, you know, whose, whose English is not great, but who is incredibly enthusiastic and has picked up, you know, kind of a, a raft of unusual uh, idioms from, from different movies and so on and comic books. And that's the boy, you know, he's got this extraordinary mixture of English. Um, which I loved writing. I was just, I got incredibly enthusiastic about it. I really, you know, he, he's one of the people I've, I've really enjoyed writing. I mean, could you give us uh, an example of the sort of things that he would say? Oh, well, I mean, he, the, the, the thing that people keep quoting back to me is full of win. He uses full of win all the time. Um, he's, uh, let's see what else have we got in there. I mean, he uses a, a lot of lead speak, which is kind of hard to do out loud. You can see it on the page. Um, but so he talks uh, about getting owned. He talks about, uh, uh, the other thing he does is he speaks in the, I, guess, I guess he sees everything in terms of movies and comics you know so I mean he actually I obviously I've already referenced Star Wars but he, he part of the, part of his kind of daily wear is a, is a t-shirt that, that proclaims that Han shot first uh, hmm. which obviously is a reference to the uh, to the, the, the kind of updated Star Wars movies where they, they kind of fudged that slightly and for me that's a religious discussion you know I remember seeing the movie and quite clearly Han Solo shoots Greedo under the table. That's completely straightforward. And then they fudged it later. So, you know, he has this kind of, uh, this vocabulary and this concept set that comes from comic books and movies and games, you know, and he's, he sees the world in those terms. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed as a big science fiction fan. I really enjoyed this, this picture you present of, of this, this idea that any, even in the most remote place on earth, you would be able to find a kid who knows what a Voight Kampf test is. Yeah, exactly. Exactly that. I mean, uh, yeah. And that's, uh, yeah. And, and for whom it is completely inconceivable that someone wouldn't know what a void camp test is. Like, you know, obviously everyone in the universe knows that. Mm -hmm. I mean, did you have to do any research at all? Or are you just, like, no, that's just like, me. emptying out I, your brain? That's, onto just, the... <laughs> that's, just, that's just absolutely me. I mean, uh, yeah. No, I mean, uh, 
I think no, I don't think I did anything at all for that. I just I just remember it all, and you know I, I treasure it. I mean I, I'm constantly kind of picking up bits of language and so on like that, which I really like. And the one that I didn't get in um, was that beautiful thing, "Tiny Grasses Dreaming," which I just think is one of the most poetic things I've ever seen. Which is you know I mean I, I'm not even sure if it's real. It's supposed to be a sign on the grass somewhere in the world uh, that, that's obviously intended to mean stay off the grass or the grass is growing or mm-hmm. something. But um, you know. But as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't matter what it's supposed to mean. It just matters that it's beautiful, you know, and I wanted so I, I wanted those things in there. Um, but that one just doesn't it doesn't have a place in the book. So I don't know, I'll carry that around for a while, use it somewhere else. OK, so I saw a, a video where you said that your initial title for this was Tiger Man Make Famous Victory Full of Win. And you said that you were going to win this battle with your publisher this time. And then I didn't. Yeah, apparently yeah, not. I, so what happened with that was, was kind of uh, fairly straightforward. I, I was uh, reading the book through and looking at the, the title, and I was suddenly just very uncomfortable that if you hadn't read the book yet, it was potentially uh, superficially mocking of people who don't speak great English. You know? And I just thought that you know, this is already a post-colonial story and it's about you know the british empire's tail end and the consequences of empire and how badly we behave and actually uh, you know it's potentially unfunny if you offend someone you know kind of taking uh, taking the mickey out of people you know from from other countries and so on it's just it wasn't a discussion i wanted to get into um i was just like actually you know what forget it you know let's let's just go with tiger man as the title and you know people can find the 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 great stuff inside the book um uh, and I, the thing is, I always have this problem with titles that I am. I, I, I work with a book uh, for however long it takes to write it, uh, and I always give it a title. Like Angel Maker was called Crazy Joe for however many years. Uh, the Gone Way World was called The Wages of Gonzo Lubitsch. And when it comes to it, um, nobody wants to use the title that I think is the only obvious title in the universe. Uh, and, you know, they're always right. <laughs> so, but, but, so I get, on the one hand, I get very entrenched because I, I get very attached to these titles. I still, you know, I still in my head, I tend to think of Angel Maker slightly as Crazy Joe because that was, you know, that was the central character and it was his story. Um, uh, and so, you know, there's a kind of desire to, to hold on to that past the point. Heaven knows what uh, the new book is going to end up being called, the one I'm writing now, because I, I have this really great title in my uh, on the front page of the of the manuscript, but it's completely incomprehensible. So, you know, uh, my editors are going to go nuts. They're just going to turn around and say, are you kidding? You know, we'll call this something that people can actually understand the first time they see the book, as opposed to having to read however many hundred pages to turn out to find out what the title means. Yeah. And I mean, so, I mean, it's obvious you've been a lifelong fan of science fiction and comic books uh, and video games. Now, did you always want to write science fiction or did that develop later? Um, I always wanted to tell stories. I don't really care. Uh, what kind of stories I end up telling. I mean, I, I, you know, and this is why, you know, every time one of my books comes out, there's a kind of brief classification tussle. Um, you know, there's a whole kind of, is this properly science fiction or is it something else? Um, and, you know, there's, there's absolutely no question that for the majority of people who read science fiction, this is the kind of thing that they read. Um, but there is a, you know, there's a taxonomical debate to be had about whether it's classically science fiction. Um, and IO9 called it so what existential pulp, which I love. <laughs> that was like one of the best things I've ever heard. Um, so I'm very determined now that I'm a, an existential pulp writer. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, so I mean, I, and the thing is that I go where the story takes me. You know, and and yes, I mean, obviously all this stuff is in my head. So everything I write tends to be mildly nuts. But um, you know, uh, I don't set out to uh, fulfill a shelving category. I set out to tell a story, and and you know, I see where it ends up. And at this time, I think Tiger Man is kind of, I mean, actually Angel Maker as well got reviewed in the thriller section rather than the science fiction section of several papers. You know, it's, you know people sort of make their own determinations, and I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, although your first novel, The Gone Away World, I think is pretty clearly science fiction by my, um, by yeah. my well, definition see, anyway. And I would agree with you, but then I got in big trouble with a couple of, of uh, kind of very academic thinkers about science fiction who were just like, well, clearly this isn't science fiction. It's la la la, whatever. <laughs> I know. And, you know, and, you know, it shouldn't be considered in that category. And, you know, I, I have no um, stomach for that fight. You know, I, I, I don't want to kind of uh, crash the party for anybody. I, all I want to do is tell the story. And, uh, you know, 
there are people who read lots of science fiction who read my stuff and are delighted by it. There are people who read lots of science fiction who, and thankfully there are fewer of these who read my stuff and hate it. Hmm. Um, you know, and, and then there are people who, generally speaking, refuse to read science fiction in any way, shape, or form because they think it's spaceship fiction and they, they see in their mind's eye when they hear those words uh, pictures of, of uh, women in bikinis with um, goldfish balls in their heads and that's science fiction. And so, that, you know, they don't read any science fiction, but they read me. You know, so, I mean, it's... Uh, it really is a shelving convention. It's you know, and that's very useful in the context of you know being in a bookshop. But it's also not useful in terms of talking about books. So I'm very content to be stuck in the middle. Although I think um, some of the time uh, my publishers wish I would write something that was a little bit more overtly recognizable because it's sometimes harder to sell a book that is less easy to categorize. Yeah. Well, I mean, talk about existential pulp. Why do you like that term so much? <laughs> Sounds awesome. <laughs> uh, I, mean, I guess because in a weird way, I, actually, it's very apposite I mean, because it's a mashup of, of you know, this very serious notion of existentialism and uh, this kind of playful, ridiculous writing form that was about churning out the largest number of words possible with kind of garish, lurid images in it and so on. And the two don't really go together, except that if you chop them up and mess them around, of course they go together. Um, and, and uh, you know, I mean... Uh, both Angel Maker and Gone Away World were kind of filled with sort of ontological angst and, and, ex and I guess ex existence angst, whether it's existential or not, is another question. Um, you know, and Tiger Man is definitely, um, you know, sort of full of, of uh, a sense of worry about what it means to be a dad and how to be the right, how to be a good person and all the rest of it. And, you know, uh, and so it belongs in that category. And then, of course, at the same time, I mean, yeah, my pulp roots are showing. I mean, you know, Here's all this serious stuff about sort of global geopolitics and the bad ways we behave overseas and about being a father and trying to do the right thing. And, you know, how do you how do you become a new person when your old life's come to an end? Uh, but the answer is you put on a superhero suit and you go fight crime. I mean, you know, the thing is, though, that actually I would do dumber things than that for my kids if that was what they needed me to do. You know, uh, I think we all would. So, I mean, it's it, it sort of I get into this thing with um about the, the definition of real. Um, there's a big sort of sense in mainstream writing and particularly literary writing that you have to be portraying a real truth and there has to be a sense of reality. And indeed, there's a kind of dogma thing, you know, the, the filmmaking thing where you're not supposed to use any um, artificial special effects and you're not supposed to use any lighting or makeup and so on. It should be just raw and real and that's the way it is. And the thing is, to me, uh, that's a, a, an illusion, particularly in writing, you know, because crazy things happen all the time. Just completely mad things happen to ordinary people every day. And everybody has some kind of crazy story about something that's happened to them. But, you know, when you go out into the world, you just meet more and more people to whom weird things have happened. There's a woman uh, who has lunch every day down the road from me. Actually, I haven't seen her for a while. And she was... Uh, uh, she operated a listening post during the Second World War. And when I say a listening post, I don't mean a signals interception station. She sat in front of a giant concrete parabolic sound mirror, and she listened for the sound of aircraft coming in over the sea. And that was her job night after night. And she was terrified that she would cough and miss the sound of a bombing raid, and hundreds of people would die. And, uh, of course, so this is this extraordinary life that she lived night after night, which if you write that, People think that's burlesque, you know, and then if you factor in, you know, that there was other stuff going on in her life, I'm sure she fell in love, you know, I'm sure stuff was happening, um, you know, that was all going on. And then at the same time, it turns out that actually all those people who were listening to those things, certainly as we moved later into the war, that it was redundant because we had radar, which we weren't telling anyone. So that was a secret. But we, you know, so then the question would be, you know, this woman on the South Coast says she's heard planes, which we already knew about. Is that enough that we can plausibly intercept those planes? You know, or, or are we going to blow the existence of radar if we do that? And we, you know, and we have to let the planes bomb some village somewhere. I mean, you know, so the idea that, you know, the, the, the ordinary mind on the ordinary day doesn't experience completely crazy stuff drives me nuts. Mm -hmm. I mean, my standard rant on "quote unquote" realistic fiction is that the most—I think the most fundamental fact about reality is that our sun is one of a hundred million stars in a galaxy. Yeah. That's just a, a galaxy. It's one of a hundred million galaxies in a universe. And you would—this is just the most fundamental thing about reality. And you would never know it from reading "quote unquote" realistic fiction. Oh no, exactly. Well, and and you know, I mean, it's quite interesting. I mean, it, it shows up in all kinds of ways. I mean, and most people generally in their daily lives do not address the fact that actually. 
the world is not Newtonian. Most of us live in a kind of billiard ball world. Um, but actually, of course, the world zings around in much stranger ways and time varies depending on your relative speed. And, so um, and you know, and people generally don't get their heads around that. And, and then, you know, so uh, yes, exactly. I mean, the world is just very much stranger than it appears. And then on a much more prosaic level, there are quite a lot of writers who, for example, do not like mobile telephones. Not as in they don't use them, but as in they don't like writing about mobile telephones because they mess up the plot. So quite a lot of the time, um, you're talking about uh, an artificially constructed 1993, um, except with you know everything else being now. Um, and so basically, you know, for me, a lot of novels that people think of as being you know, sort of real are actually basically sort of alternative reality fiction, you know, uh, designed to be in a kind of a technological world um, in order to, you know, in order to get to something that is supposed to be fundamental. And the thing that is supposed to be fundamental is, is the sort of the human condition uh, and the human emotional state. And the thing is that that also exists only in the interaction with the world and the world contains this technology. So you can't do it honestly without discussing in some level accounting for technology. And so that reticence makes me cranky. I mean, why do you think so many writers are reluctant to take that on? Is it just that they don't know technology? or I think a lot of writers are reluctant because it messes with plot. I mean, if you read the here and now, the Paul Oster, um, Jim Curtsy dialogues, um, which they conducted by fax, um, you know, there's a section where they address this. And, and uh, Curtsy says, you know, um, uh, I don't like mobile phones. They mess up plotting. They make things more difficult. You know, and they, they, they short circuit plot uh, and they they bring people together to communicate and communication resolves conflict and so on um, which I mean which is true you know uh, uh, conflict is as my uh, school teacher told me uh, conflict is the heart of drama and you know communication absolutely can resolve it so that is a problem but the thing is that you know I mean uh, and we're talking about you know and, and Austin meanwhile it does use technology and stuff so there's a whole discussion going on there you know but uh, the thing is uh, it, we're talking about something that happens. It's real. So, uh, you know, as soon as you say, well, I tell, I like to tell the sort of real human story, but I won't use this technology because it gets in the way of telling the real human story. You're in a very weird place for me. You know, so there's that, there's a convenience aspect in terms of plotting. It takes away from your ability to do the kind of pure unity of narrative because there's a danger people will meet too early and talk and it's a real danger. Um, but I think you just have to get around it. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, th then there's the other thing that actually, you know, technology and technological activities very often don't dramatize well. Sitting, talking on the phone, typing onto a keyboard, whatever, you know, those are not things that particularly work well as scenes. Um, and they work terribly in movies, but even, you know, even in books, they don't work very well. Um, so you, know, you have to kind of work around that. And again, you know, it feels uncomfortable. And I think underlying that, there's an unease about Technology as something that's kind of scientific and purely cognitive and therefore somehow opposed to an emotional engagement with the world, which is a whole other discussion, which I'm uncomfortable with, you know, but a lot of people feel that way. And therefore, you know, as soon as you introduce um, a beige box or an IMAX screen or an iPhone into a conversation, you know, you're somehow uh, getting away from what a narrative of what's important about life. And I think it's wrong, but I think people are frightened of it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I mean, you say technology resolves conflict, but certainly we live in a world with plenty of technology oh, and plenty of conflict as well. Communication can resolve conflict. Technology, no. Technology can, can provoke an awful lot of conflict, too. Absolutely. Um, no, and I mean, you know, uh, this, is the, you know, this is the sort of logical tail end of, of that point is, is that um, I saw an ad years ago, actually when I was in the States, I was living in New York, and uh, there was an ad on the Discovery Channel, which was a really, really, really old guy in black and white on the screen. He's talking into camera, and he's, I, I kind of think he's, we only see him to the shoulder, but I don't think he's wearing a, a shirt. You just have this kind of, and um, he's saying, uh, he's telling us how many children he has, how many grandchildren he has, how many great-grandchildren he has. He's talking about the fact that, you know, he's thinking he's going to go and uh, maybe do a degree because, you know, it's been a long time since he did any studying and so on. And, you know, this extraordinary kind of huge number of people who are his direct family and, you know, his plans that he has and so on. And then he says, I want you to meet someone, but you'll have to be very gentle and quiet because my mother's quite shy. 
And, you know, he's like a thousand years old already. So the idea that he has a mother is completely extraordinary, you know. Um, and underneath the caption was, when this happens, you'll want to know why. And we will, when that happens, but want to know why. And I think a lot of, kind of mainstream culture isn't going to tell us and isn't preparing us for that conversation. And, you know, there are, there are a lot of, I mean, every funky scientific experiment that happens provides me with another piece of ammunition about this. The most recent one for me was the really extraordinary one was actually the, um, the program where they, uh, where they networked a couple of rats together in late 2012. Do you know about this? This is where they drive them around by remote control? or Well, no. Uh, it's even crazier than that. So basically, there's a, there was a team in the U.S. I can't remember exactly where, and I think the other team was in South America. Was it Brazil? Doesn't matter. Um, uh, and they um, uh, they put electrodes uh, quite you know quite crudely into the. I mean, scientifically and with great precision, but it's you know the object is crude. It's a great big spike um, into into the the brain of each rat. And one rat had run a maze, and the other one had not. And once they networked them together over the internet, by the way, <laughs> the second rat, which had not run the maze, was able to run the maze faster using the memory of the first rat. And the thing that was extraordinary about it was not that they'd done that, but was even crazier was the guy who was running the experiment said, listen, the thing you have to understand here is that we have not created uh, web telepathic rats. <laughs> we haven't made two rats talk to each other telepathically. What we've done is turn two rats into one rat with two bodies on a kind of basic level. Um, and I was just blown away by that because I was, you know, I sort of feel that I, I generally kind of try to keep my eye on the sort of concept of humanity reshaping stuff that we are doing. And that one had completely passed me by. Like I was ready for the idea that we can start to do proper uh, brain machine interface so that you can have proper prosthetic limbs with really good nerve feedback and so on and so on, directly moved by the brain rather than by kind of, you know, combination of muscle signals. Um, I wasn't ready for the idea that we could network two brains together. And in fact, I had thought that that kind of thing was much more difficult. So it turns out these guys have done it. Now, there'll be all kinds of stumbling blocks along the way, but ultimately what you're talking about is the beginning of the possibility of getting inside someone else's head and indeed merging two people together, which is a completely society reshaping possibility. You know, whether we pursue it or not, how we deal with it and so on, you know, those are those are the things that determine whether a science becomes a usable technology or, you know, whether it becomes a culture. But the possibility is there for something completely extraordinary. Um, and you could walk from one end of my country to the other without finding, as far as I know, anything being written as a consequence of that, you know, I'm sure someone's got it somewhere, um, you know, but it, it's, it seems to be, and certainly outside of science fiction, you're not going to hear a mention of it, you know, uh, and indeed the newspaper articles that covered it, broadly speaking, a lot of them begin with, it sounds like science fiction, but, which is kind of media code for, hey, guess what, you can ignore this, but isn't this a weird thing? Um, you know, and it's, it's a phrase that if, if I ever became editor of a, of a media organization, I would ban from use forever. You simply never get to say this anymore because it, it's a sort of cultural tag um, or a, 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 a coded kind of rhetorical tag that just means, you know, by all means, tune out. This isn't actually that important. And the thing is, it, is. it always is when something like that gets said or something very important. Yeah, no, I, I feel exactly the same way that, you know, they always say this. It sounds like science fiction. The implication being it sounds like something crazy that can never happen. The implication being all science fiction is crazy stuff that can never happen when, in fact, lots of it comes true. Yeah, no, exactly. I, yeah, the, the implication is, you know, um, uh, yeah, precisely. This is this is this is this week's episode of Star Trek. You know, you may miss it. You may not. Um, uh, you know, but I find that very bizarre. I really do. I, I kind of. It seems to me that there's sort of determined effort to ignore completely extraordinary things that are happening. Um, uh, and, and it's a very, very odd thing. I mean, you do find people, I would say you find people writing about it in science fiction. I think one thing that's interesting is that uh, you have authors like Cory Doctorow or Neil Stevenson, who are yeah. classically were science fiction authors, but they're actually writing about real life right now because real life has become so science fictional that... Uh, you can write about things that are actually happening and it reads like science fiction. And it reads like science fiction, yeah. But see, now that's quite interesting to me because first of all, that's, I mean, you know, uh, that's fascinating. And I, you know, and I enjoy living in that world. I wouldn't choose to live at any other time, although this is in many ways, you know, here we go, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. You know, um, 
but that's very, you know, I find that very promising. It fills me with hope for the future that we're kind of doing this extraordinary stuff. I think we need to be in more control of our own genome. I think all that stuff, because otherwise, you know, I, I think the problems that we've, we've created for ourselves through the Industrial Revolution period are just going to swamp us. You know, but um, at the same time, I find that weird and a little bit worrying because, uh, you know, I have this shtick about spaceship fiction, right? That, that, that for a long time, a lot of science fiction was about spaceships because the future as we saw it was composed of hard science travel to other worlds. That was the next logical step. That was the kind of Apollo program ethos that this was the beginning of something. We were leaving the kind of planetary envelope and going out into space, and we didn't do it. Um, you know, we got as far as the moon, and then we decided to do something else for a while. So that kind of ethos, nonetheless, driven by those incredible illustrations that NASA commissioned of, of orbital housing. If you've seen those, they're amazing. They're mm-hmm, kind of yeah. great tauruses with the, and they're basically the suburbs in space with the best view ever. You know, um, uh, and people kind of uh, almost literally in a, in a business suit with a goldfish bowl in their heads. You know, it's it's, it's great stuff. Um, but it kind of defined an era, and then when it didn't happen. Um, people got funny talking, hopefully, about science, and they got cautious, and they got, you know, well, we won't be fooled again, or we won't fool ourselves again. But at, the same, but at the same time, science fiction carried right on ahead in the spaceship fiction mode a lot of the time. And people continue to think about science fiction as being spaceship fiction. But as you say, as we get a more science fiction-feeling world, um, it gets harder and harder to pursue those shapes. They start to feel weirdly dated. And at the same time, um, well, and also you have very valid and, and, you know, very problematic critiques, which basically say, you know, this is a kind of white Western European male heteropatriarchal fantasy of space colonization. It's the West reenacted in space. You know, why are we still telling the story in 2014, which is another, you know, very strong thing to be talking about. Um, and it's important. But so the combination of those things, you, you suddenly kind of have a, a difficulty with that kind of fiction, which we should, but we've also pushed the science in many cases so far that everything that you could try as an alternative starts to feel familiar uh, and reheated. And so, you know, how do you write science fiction in that environment? You either write about now or, you know, tomorrow, or you write about parallel worlds, or you have to come up with something that's completely off the shelf, off the wall, rather, just going completely nuts. Um, you know, and then people start to say, well, that's, you know, <laughs> I mean, and then that's one of the boxes that I kind of get into is people start to say, well, that's not really science fiction because, you know, the, the science is absurd or the, you know, the, the what if question is completely ludicrous, which, I mean, you know, guilty as charged in many cases. Well, but a lot of um, real science is absurd. I mean, yeah, well, that's also true. I mean, yeah, Occam's razor is another of the things with which we have to contend because it's, it's actually baseless. It's just a kind of, it's an inductive reasoning trap. But the thing that, Kind of, I get to from that is that we need uh, science fiction that's about uh, biotechnological possibilities, that's about the possibilities of consciousness, and all these things are being done. Um, but there isn't the same sort of singularity of purpose. There isn't the same sense of a drive to the stars. Um, so people kind of haven't hoisted on board quite that science fiction is more than just spaceship fiction, and that it needs to be maybe. Um, Incidentally, I love spaceship fiction. I mean, good, solid spaceship fiction is fantastic. Um, uh, but I think it becomes increasingly problematic, and you can see the problems with it in the extraordinary efforts that people who write good spaceship fiction are going to to kind of combine it with new societies and new ideas about you know impossible technologies. And, you know, Ian Banks, when you know he was alive, was writing things like Accession about this extraordinary high-tech culture. Um, encountering a, t- a culture whose technology it doesn't understand, you know, um, uh, uh, which is a potential extinction event for them. You know, it, it could it could turn out to be the moment where they're simply overmatched, and and you know they're like the guys on the small island when when the great big sailing ship appears with the armed men on it. You know, so um, it's a very. I think he says that uh, an accession is the kind of thing that most cultures only encounter much in the same way that a sentence encounters a full stop. Uh, you know, I mean, it's 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 great stuff, but still and all, I think uh, for me, I want to be pushing in directions that are not in that area and are unexpected and that force you to recast your sense of what people are and what 
it means to be in the future, what the future looks like, is going to be more weird and more unexpected than, you know, that template would normally allow. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned Ian M. Banks, and he's one of my favorite authors. And he didn't—they didn't even used to sell him in the U.S. I didn't even discover him until I, I did a study abroad in Ireland, and like a third of the science fiction section there is Ian M. Banks. The the kind of the weird lack of crossover, or you know, the, the number of authors who are published here but not there, or there but not here, who are amazing, um, is very very strange. I mean, you know, I wonder well, it's, it's just never mind whether it's whatever. It's, it's just it bewilders me who is and who is not, kind of you know, published transatlantically and so on. I, and Banks, yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I always bewildered that Lois McMaster Dujol was better known here um, because I think she's an extraordinary storyteller, um, you know, uh, and, uh, and yet, you know, uh, I, I don't think she has. I mean, and Tim Powers, you know, for a long time, I think was not published here or was published only kind of quite quietly. Um, and he's an extraordinary writer as well, you know, so... Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, we've interviewed Lois McMaster Bruce on the show. Tim Power is definitely one of my favorite authors. Um, how much involvement do you have with the science fiction community? I mean, do you hang out with science fiction authors or go to science fiction conventions, that sort of thing? Uh, mostly what I hang out with is my kids because I, I'm, <laughs> I'm the dad of two small children, the, the three and one. So um, they eat up a lot of my time when I'm not writing. And, I, and I'm kind of I'm naturally kind of focused on them and my wife and my writing, almost to the exclusion of everything else. But actually, I'm at, uh, I was at Nine Worlds uh, on Friday, um, which is a, a wonderful fan convention here. And I'm at uh, Worldcon on Monday the 18th, um, talking, basically talking about this, talking about, you know, kind of where science fiction waterfalls into the mainstream and vice versa. Um, you know, and so I do, I mean, I, and uh, I, I have some, uh, you know, I have great fun. I, have to, I, I had the enormous pleasure of meeting Bill Gibson um, a while ago, who I knew Neuromancer was one of my kind of formative books, and, and he's one of the nicest men in the universe, which is always really nice um, when someone you admire turns out to be an incredibly nice person, you know. Um, and actually, I'm supposed to be um, kind of, uh, at some point in the next 24 hours, I have to book a table for lunch with a bunch of writers. So, you know, I, um, I mean, yes, I absolutely kind of hang out to the extent that I hang out with anybody. <laughs> Those guys are on my list of people I hang out with. Um, but I, I'm, uh, I'm kind of so constantly trying to claw back some time to write a book at the moment that I'm, I, I'm probably less sociable than I would be otherwise. Well, I mean, just looking over your Twitter feed, it looks like you, you retweet John Scalzi a lot and you've contributed yeah. things to his um, big idea. Yeah, absolutely. And I, was, I, I, I have never met him in person, but I would really like to. He seems like a really nice guy. Um, so that's that's one of my kind of excitements for the future is I get to do that at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, let's uh, talk a bit more about Tiger Man. Uh, yeah. So um, one thing I, I was wondering about is there's a scene early in the book where the main character uh, makes an improvised grenade out of a biscuit tin. Yes. And I was just wondering if that's possible and how you, if it is, how you discovered that that's possible. <laughs> I was warned. Uh, a long time ago about that being possible. Uh, exactly how possible it is, I'm not sure. So the caution about explosive yield, which is in the book, is, is a caution that was given to me by uh, my chemistry teacher when I was at school. Um, and it's true about a lot of uh, powders with a very fine um, grain size. Uh, custard powder is one, pepper is another, um, that if you put a small amount of them in a box and shake it up and then throw in a match, you get a big whoomph. Uh, and it is a real do not try this at home uh, moment, um, because, uh, you know, you, you can, uh, you know, you, you could get a real kind of power of flame. Or you, uh, and if you enclose that, obviously you get, ex you get an explosion. I don't know, to be honest, exactly how powerful that explosion would really be. Um, I think if you absolutely nailed the, the distribution and, you know, you, you added the, 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 the trail of gunpowder, maybe, uh, you might get a seriously big bang. I just don't know. Um, but it, it's one of those things where it's sort of ridiculous enough to be plausible, and I didn't want to check it and mess it up. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I, but it certainly you could certainly you would get a respectable flash and a bang out of that. Whether whether you'd get any kind of serious percussive force, I don't know. That's interesting. You know, I mean, I know that your father is the famous spy thriller author, yeah. John Le Carre. I was just I just imagined growing up that you guys just talked about garrote wires and like, poisons and you know, stuff over the dinner table that's a great idea um i wish we had i know i mean I, I don't think he was ever that kind of spy i think he was more the kind of sit behind a desk um you know and take reports 
from agents in the field. I, I mean, he's very reticent about exactly what he did. He, he, he asserts strongly that it wasn't very much and that he was quite bad at it. Um, so we, we have not done the, the seminar on custard powder explosive. <laughs> um, uh, but no, I mean, I, I, I kind of, I have a tendency with things like that to kind of work something which is approximately possible under the right circumstances and just let it go. Um, because uh, I'm, you know, the thing that I'm definitely not is is a hard science guru. You know, I, my scientific qualifications are relatively scant. Um, I like science. I try really hard to educate myself about it. But in the end, if something has to go boom and it would probably only go foosh, <laughs> I am relatively unconcerned about that, which is a sin, but not, I think, a grave one. Mm. Uh, I also saw you say in a video that your father's father was a confidence trickster. Yes. Uh, he was somewhat notorious uh, uh, for, for, yeah, uh, a little bit of professional trickery from time I mean, to time. What sort of things did he do? Um, I, I'm not really supposed to answer that question anymore. His, his uh, surviving family, apart from us, are getting a little bit tired of hearing about it. Um, but he did some pretty colorful stuff. And, and you know, my, um, my advantage in this respect is that although he was still around when I was born, I don't remember him as a person. So I have actually all the kind of great stories um, uh, about sort of selling a bunch of uh, unbreakable plates to a Greek wedding, which you can imagine didn't go down very well. Um, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, but the um, the reality of it, I think, you know, was potentially a little bit darker, but, uh, you know, I just don't know. I wasn't there. I just, it just strikes me as kind of interesting that you're, Father is a. I mean, that the novelists and confidence tricksters are two species of writer uh, of liar. A, in a, a way. storyteller, yeah, absolutely, a, a fiction maker, yeah. And well, and more than that, you know, as a novelist, your job is is to persuade people of things they know aren't true, you know, um, and, and at the same time to impart in some way something that is. Um, but you know, under under the heavy cover of of darkness, you know, you're really you're in the business of fiction, you're in the business of storytelling, you're not in the business of, of uh, you know, sort of offloading great chunks of, uh, of actual facts and mm -hmm. sort of forcing people to memorize them. So, yeah, no, so there's an absolute similarity there and plausibility. I mean, that, that definitely runs in my family. We're all plausible uh, and, and, you know, kind of usually able to find an explanation for where we are when we shouldn't be or something. But, you know, uh, yes, that's a, that's a comparison which makes me giggle. Well, I mean, there's a line in this book about how it's hard to lie backward. Is that a... Is yeah, that that's thing? apparently true, but I got that off a TV show. Uh, <laughs> okay. That's, you know, that's one of those things. Uh, um, yeah, there's, I, I think it's hard to, uh, you know, I and mean, this is one of those things, I'm not even sure where it comes from exactly. My recollection is that in interrogation, it's difficult to lie in reverse because you can't keep the sequence of events straight because you have mem you have come you've imagined it rather than actually remembering it. The other thing, though, is, you know, which actually I suppose really mitigates against that is that uh, interrogators, as I understand it, one of the things they look for is stories that are too perfect, where people remember exactly the sequence of events and never change. Because when you've done that, it's because you've memorized it rather than because you know, you're, you're trying. Normally, if someone's telling a, a true story, they'll go back and they'll revise. Yeah, right. And, and I mean, I mean, novelists are always told to include all the telling details, but I've heard that that's one sign that someone's lying to you is if they're you know, they're trying too hard if they're including too much detail. I think, yeah, I think in, in the name of being able to continue to lie convincingly, assuming that I ever could, I, I try to avoid information about how to sound plausible. Because I think the more test conscious you become, the more obvious your deceptions become. <laughs> um, I, you know, but I think, I mean, as a matter of reality, I mean, in when you're writing, it's always about sleight of hand. You know, you include just enough detail that people start to fill in the rest for themselves. And then they think that you've described something perfectly, whereas what you've actually done is indicate you've drawn a vector drawing and they've then filled in the colors and the surfaces, you know. Um, and I do that. I mean, I have to do that a lot because I tend to pick things which are impossibly difficult to describe. So the, the state of mind of being a genius, you know, which, which is not something into which I have insight. Um, you know, uh, uh, and so what you have to do for that, I mean, particularly a mathematical genius is just, you know, I, I, my math is poor. And I, again, it's something, well, that's not true. My arithmetic is poor. My math is completely untested because I never got <laughs> past the arithmetic stage at school. You know, <laughs> um, I have, I have the, 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 the qualification that you take when you're 16 as a matter of, you know, you have no choice but to take it. I, I have that in math, but nothing else. Um, and actually, you know, everything to that point is just brute calculation. You don't get to do any proper mathematics. Um, 
So, you know, but so in any case, I have no grip as a matter of sort of personal experience on what it's like to be brilliant with numbers. But I read uh, G.H. Hardy's book, Mathematician's Apology, which is absolutely fantastic. And the first thing that I realized was this was an account of a creative life. You know, the fact that this guy worked with numbers and I work with words does not alter the fact that everything he says really about the experience of being G.H. Hardy is very familiar to me from being me, you know, in terms of kind of work and how you feel about it and so on. And so that was very nice. But then specifically in terms of numbers, you know, what I did with Angel Maker and, and the, the, the brilliant mathematician in Angel Maker was just keep telling everybody that she was brilliant and then give her an insoluble mathematical problem and she solves it. You know, and everyone, you know, if you if you balance the emotional flow and the you know and the action right, when she does something that feels impossible, instead of saying, well, that's just impossible, people go, well, of course it's impossible, except that it's not impossible. It's just really, really hard. And she's a genius, so she's done it. You know, and then they believe and they invest more and more in the idea that she's brilliant. You know, and then it, she becomes effectively magic. Um, you know, which is great. That's exactly what you want because you you can't possibly you know, if you start trying to write down a clear account of, of the thought process in her head, first of all, you have to be a genius or go find someone. And second of all, you've got to be a genius to understand it. Um, and so the novel's going to get slightly derailed while everyone goes running off to, you know, kind of try and work out what the hell that paragraph was about. <laughs> yeah, actually, I had exactly the same experience. I, I had read uh, Ernest Hemingway's For Whom the Bell Tolls and the character uh, blows, he's good at blowing up bridges. And in my head, I remembered that there was a lot of detail about how to blow up bridges. And then I went back and analyzed it, and there's almost no detail about how to blow up bridges, but there's a lot of detail about how it feels to have the confidence that you know how to blow up a bridge. <laughs> yeah, that's the gig. That's exactly it. And it's the same, I mean, for me particularly, it's the same with action sequences. I mean, I have a better understanding of action sequences because I have this kind of early, incompetent, but nonetheless comprehensive martial arts education. Um, and so I know what the body mechanics feel like, and I know what the crucial point of any sort of physical exchange is going to be. I, you know, I know where the, the, the moment is where one person takes the other person's um, momentum away from them or moves their, moves their center of gravity somewhere they didn't want it to be and so on. I understand how that works. I just can't do any of it. But what that helps with is that, you know, I don't really bother to tell you about the kind of terribly exciting flurry of blows, which in a movie would look really great, but on the page is just dull. But I do tell you about the crucial moment where the, what you know, the person who's grabbing you by the wrist is suddenly the person who's you know now flying through the air, and how that feels, and people respond to that and they get very excited by the action sequence. And that again is a, it's not exactly a piece of sleight of hand, but it's the one detail that you need as opposed to the twenty or thirty that kind of look as if they might be a good idea, but actually aren't. Hmm. I mean, uh, speaking of sleight of speaking of hands, uh, your author photo in this book has some you have some writing on your hand. <laughs> I do. Uh, and it's actually even relevant. Uh, that photograph was taken at the Edinburgh Festival a couple of years ago when I was writing Tiger Man. And um, the, uh, the, the uh, text is, if I can remember, it's a reminder to me that there's a, um, a book called The Last Stand of the DNA Cowboys by Mick Farron, which had a, a passage about um, a, a seasonal madness that comes into play in a place where one of the characters is living. And I wanted to go back and reread that to remind me about the effect of uh, geography and seasonal shift on mood. Um, and actually, of course, when I went back and reread it, it's exactly what we've just been talking about. There's very little of that in there. It just happens and it's really affecting and it's powerful because it's very well done. Um, and then there was also a note there to reread Ned Bowman's book, The Teleportation Accident, which is, Absolutely. Have you read that? It's absolutely fantastic. I haven't, no. It's completely nuts. It's basically this incredibly long science fiction shaggy dog story with some of the funniest uh, kind of goofy passages in it. It's, uh, you know, it, you, you've got to take a good solid run at it because it's quite densely written. Ned's a very, very good writer. He's irritatingly talented and young. It drives me crazy. Um, now, it's also really nice, which makes it worse. Um, uh, but if you want to get into it, it's this kind of goofy, strange, disturbed story about a guy who's basically a kind of slacker party society guy in Berlin um, who's also a theater designer rebuilding this extraordinary theatrical mechanism. And then it becomes a kind of, it, it gets stranger and stranger as it goes along. There's a kind of Lovecraft kind of aspect to it, which is very small. But then there's a kind of other science fictional aspect about actual teleportation, which is again in the 
Um, and and you think the whole thing, I mean, the whole thing is just incredibly amusing. And then it gets to the very far end. And for me, the last couple of pages delivered a punchline I did not see coming that made me laugh a lot. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's a great book. Uh, and I can't even remember what it was that I wanted so much <laughs> to reread in reference to Tiger Man. Uh, because, but obviously I must have done it because... Uh, you know, I, I I did it and I finished the book and it was okay. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so there's a note on my hand from you know it's a, it's a genuine part of the process. Although these days I tend to use Evernote rather more and and the back of my hand rather less. Mm -hmm. um, and also then uh, just beneath that your bio it says that your wife is a human rights lawyer. She is. And I was just wondering. I mean, you, you mentioned there's all this stuff in the book about the fleet and all the human rights abuses they're doing. Uh, was that influenced at all by hearing her talk about stuff she's absolutely, working on? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, and and there's this extraordinary thing which is happening at the moment, um, where you know it's it, the, the it's possible uh, that uh, we'll get some clarity on what did and did not happen on the island, or and is is not happening on the island of Diego Garcia, um, which uh, is being suggested in the in the newspapers here at the moment as the possible site of a, a black detention facility. Um, and when I was writing Tiger Man, Diego Garcia was in the news, uh, or was in my head, having been in the news relatively recently, because um, the, uh, the the tangle that the British government gets itself into every time Diego Garcia comes up, because the legal status of, of rendition in the UK is pretty clear cut, it's just basically not allowed. So if, if a rendition flight touches down in the UK, that's a big deal for our government, because it basically means that they're breaking the law, uh, as far as I can see anyway. Um, so there's a whole thing. So every time that Diego Garcia comes up, there's a whole thing that happens, um, uh, and they go nuts about it. Um, and they got themselves into a tangle in, I can't remember, 2004, 2006, and again in 2008, you know. So uh, anyway, that was all very much on, you know, in my mind. Um, and then it went away for a while, and then just a, a, for a U UK publication, um, almost to compensate me for the fact that Ukraine just went into kind of total catastrophe and I had Ukrainian characters who made no mention of it. Um, uh, I, instead of, instead of getting that right, I got, uh, this, this business about Diego Garcia being back in the news. The really great thing about that right now that I'm really treasuring in that kind of horrified, I can't believe this is the planet I live on kind of way is that as far as I know, the British government is currently maintaining that, uh, the crucial documents to a case that involves Diego Garcia were damaged in water damage uh, in, in the archives in Diego Garcia in June 2014, um, which was a, a, a very kind of, well, it was, it was an unusually but not ridiculously dry month in Diego Garcia. You know, it's just kind of, it's one of those things where you just kind of like, okay, well, we're just never going to know, are we? You're just not going to tell us, so whatever. Mm. I mean, one thing we were talking about in the last episode was how the climate for writing spy thrillers has been changed by... Edward Snowden and all the revelations that have come out about all these yeah. horrible things the government, our, our own governments, <laughs> are doing. Um, how does that affect your ability to write a spy thriller when people are so suspicious of the quote-unquote good guys? Well, I mean, that's. I guess in the first place, for me, I mean, I don't really. I mean, Tiger Man kind of isn't really a spy thriller. It has an espionage angle. It has a, well, actually more than that. It has a geopolitics angle. It doesn't really have an espionage angle. Um, you know, so I haven't got to go there. But, um, I mean, there's, a, there's an awareness of the possibility of surveillance in the book, but it's quite lightweight. Um, you know, but one of the things that happens is you know, actually the way that the sergeant and the boy first end up talking to one another is that they both take the batteries out of their mobile phones. They both have a habit of doing that. Um, you know, so there's a kind of awareness of that there. So for me, it's not a problem. I, but, I mean, you know, it's again this thing about technology and the intrusion of, you know, our awareness of it into the sort of conventional shapes of the spy thriller because actually... You know, the U.S. in particular, but also, as it turns out, the U.K. pours money into technological analysis of signals and so on. Um, you know, and actually, a lot of a lot of stuff, um, you know, is just we just decode it, or we, you know, we get it and we break it, or we do it with data. You know, that's the other slightly terrifying thing about the drone program is that it seems to be that metadata is enough to get you drones now, um, which is slightly alarming. Um, you know, so. Uh, for me, it's sort of it's it's not a problem. It's just how the world is. But I can see if you're writing a kind of more conventional um, espionage thriller, it's it's a serious problem because it's kind of you know um, it, it changes it changes stuff. But it doesn't. Uh, I don't think it shuts down those those stories. I think it just makes you know you just have to be a little bit more complex about it. Mm -hmm. 
I also, I, we're running a little short on time, but I also did want to ask you about this book you wrote a few years ago called The Blind Giant, uh, Being Human in a Digital World. I, I just read the description of it, but it says that uh, you talk about how we risk living in a world which is designed to serve computers and corporations rather than people. I was just wondering if you could expand on that. Yeah, I mean, that's a kind of, I mean, the point about The Blind Giant was that it, was, it wasn't supposed to be, a, as it were, a technology-heavy book about technology, so it wasn't supposed to go out of date as quickly as it would if it was mentioning specific implementations of technology. It was more about the kind of the human aspect, how we deal with our technology, how we interface with it, and where we, you know, where technology becomes uh, a cultural influence and so on. So, um, I mean, the, the, the business about kind of um, building a world that's actually sort of intended for computers and corporations is kind of perfectly pointed up. If you've read Flash Boys, which is a wonderful read, the new Michael Lewis uh, about algorithmic trading and, and uh, what happened there, that's an absolutely fantastic read. I mean, the meat of it is that basically uh, it seems that for a, kind of a period of a, a couple of years, maybe, um, you know, the, the, the infrastructure of uh, trading was reconfigured to favor a new model and almost no one knew. Um, and so traditional kind of brokers and so on were at a massive disadvantage and they were losing really large sums of money per year because their own software was in a sense or the way that their the way that the trading system was laid out their own software was putting them at a disadvantage and that you know and their infrastructure was and and that was essentially it was partly about the construction of a uh, a fast pipe between uh, exchanges and so on. it's i don't want to get into it because i don't want to spoil it and also because i don't want to say something that someone could sue me for <laughs> but uh you know uh, the 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 book is is a perfect example of that. But basically, it seems to me that, you know if you take the automobile as an example, if you imagine like imagine that today uh, a a bunch of aliens drop down from the sky and they say you know we'll give you much much faster transportation, personal transportation, but we'll also just kill a certain number of you a year randomly. Like it's we're giving you the teleport device, but it's only 99% reliable. Sometimes you just get vaporized. Um, and by the way, you're going to have to build. Uh, rivers through your major cities of this foreign chemical that will kill you if you touch it. Um, you know, would you take the technology? No, but that's the automobile. That's exactly what we've done. You know, so uh, you know, we, we we've already reconfigured our world to make parts of it hostile to human life. Um, you know, and and useful for machines. And we're doing the same thing with various bits of digital technology. The question is not, you know, oh my God, how do we stop this from happening because it's going to happen. The question is. How do we constrain it? How do we make it serve us rather than creating systems that are basically um, born in the the sort of uh, ring binder DNA, as Neil Stevens would call it, of, of corporate culture? Because you know, big corporations are not always the best decision makers for people on the ground. You know, you see that in the fracking situation, uh, and governments likewise. Um, you know, uh, it, 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 I I find uh, politics kind of increasingly depressing uh but i think uh, you know that may just be an aspect of being 40. <laughs> well I mean, one of the craziest things i've heard sort of along the lines you were saying is i read about this proposal to create a, a sort of a line of hovering drones across the ocean in order to transmit stock market orders a fraction huh. of a second earlier right yeah well, I mean, yeah, I mean, that that's actually, that's the kind of thing that they deal with in Flash Boys. And I, I, if the if the end point of the Flash Boys narrative is accurate, I think the uh, impetus to do that may have faded away. Um, but that's also partly maybe because I don't properly understand, you know, the the, the mechanisms of, of that kind of trading. What I do think is that it's one of the areas in, in our kind of financial world where we need to look very hard at what we are evolving. I mean, it seems to me that basically a lot of stuff in finance, particularly is emergent. And actually, you know, it'll come along. And if someone kind of doesn't really think about it and just starts doing it, they may make a lot of money. And then that may kind of crash the rest of the market. And then we're all kind of back in 2007, you know, kind of wondering where all the money's gone. Um, and, you know, actually, we don't have to live like that anymore. We, you know, we can say, okay, guess what? We are choosing this particular version of the game. We are not choosing your game because it'll blow everything up. Um, so actually, you know, stand down that particular way of doing business. Uh, I also wanted to ask you about this thing you said. You said a corporation is not a person unless I can punch it in the face for being <laughs> a jackass. Yeah, 
Really? Seriously? You know, uh, the thing is, obviously, I'm not going to go around punching people in the face. That's not really my thing. <laughs> but, uh, the, you know, but the statement of personhood, you know, unless the, the more mature version of that statement is actually something that I think John Scalzi may even have said um, on his blog, that uh, a corporation is not a person until and unless it can go to prison. If a person commits murder or even if, you know, it, uh, what, what we would call manslaughter, you know, they can go to prison for that. Um, certainly, we wouldn't consider it an adequate punishment to fine them, uh, say, a fifth of their income. You know, that's not acceptable. So, you know, if you want a corporation to be a person, if they're going to have the kind of rights of personhood that, you know, is, uh, are being accorded to them, particularly in the U.S., it seems to me that they also have to have the risk that goes with that. You know, if you get caught doing something very, very bad, you know, you, you can uh, you can go to prison for the rest of your life. You know, in a, in a corporate sense, you know, I don't know exactly what that would mean. But, you know, some states still have the death penalty, which as, as an aside, I'm not in favor of. But, you know, if you're in a state with the death penalty and you're operating as a corporation and you kill someone, um, I guess maybe you should get the corporate electric chair and you should just cease to exist as a corporation, you know. But uh, so it seems to me if you're going to follow that metaphor in that direction, that's the way it takes. And, you know, I was being a little frivolous. So I said, I'm a corporation, not a, not a person until I can push it in the face, which is, you know. As I say, the cheeky version of all that rather more sophisticated stuff. <laughs> all right, so we're just about out of time. Uh, do you want to just tell us about the next book you're working on? I, I hear it has six main characters, alchemy, semiotics, time travel, and Greek politics. Yeah, so it would seem. Um, I, I, I have a history of biting off more than I can chew uh, because it's kind of the only way that I, I can sort of, I don't know, sort of feel the momentum increasing as I write. Um, and so this is very much that. Um, it started out with five characters, which I figured was enough. And then uh, in order to uh, deal with one of the characters, I, I realized I had to have another one. Um, there's an issue about who is actually the truthful narrator, if any of them are. Um, and there's a whole host, as you see, of, of different categories. And basically, um, it begins with uh, a woman under interrogation. And we're seeing directly into her head. There's a kind of surveillance state issue there. And, you know, we talked about earlier about the network rats and so on. So I am writing about that. Um, and then we're also dealing with uh, a, a woman in the far past, uh, a somewhat genderless entity in the far future, um, and so on, and, and, and a Greek banker and, and indeed uh, an Ethiopian painter. Um, and yeah, I mean, and, and they are all looking for something that may or not be the same thing and suffering from a problem that may or may not be the same problem. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm a little bit daunted by it, but at the same time, I'm really enjoying it. <laughs> well, as long as it's got time travel, I'm there. Oh, uh, there is there is uh, mysticism, time travel, various different uh, iterations of the possibility of, of magic and science. It's, uh, you know, um, I'm I'm kind of yeah, I'm hoping it's really going to blow people's socks off. But uh, you know, I'm halfway through the book. You can only ever. Uh, sort of be be uh, as sure as you are through the book you know so when i'm 60 percent of the way through the book i'll be 60 percent sure it's going to be okay <laughs> you know? um uh, and right now i'm kind of sitting here kind of holding all the pieces and staring at them on the ground and thinking oh my god what have <laughs> i done you know why did i not just write something very simple um but it seems to be it's not in me to do that <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, it sounds great. And I think we're going to have to wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with Nick Harkaway and his new book is called Tigerman. So Nick, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. And that was our interview. So thanks again to Nick Harkaway for joining us on the show. And for our panel, we'll be discussing the new Marvel movie Guardians of the Galaxy. And this will involve spoilers. So just be aware of that. And I'm joined today by three guest geeks. So first up, we've got my longtime co-host, John Joseph Adams. He's the editor and publisher of Lightspeed and Nightmare Magazines, and the series editor of Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy. He's also edited many other anthologies, including the recent books The End is Nigh, Dead Man's Hand, and Help Fund My Robot Army. So, John, welcome back. Greetings, mortals. Then next up, we've got Matt London, making his 11th appearance on the show. He's the author of The Eighth Continent, an eco-adventure sci-fi novel which comes out on September 16th. He's also the creator of the web series Space Pirates in Space, and his short fiction appears in The Living Dead 2, Daily Science Fiction, and Space and Time. So, Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me back. And also joining us today is author and film producer Rob Bland, who you may remember from our panel on Batman back in episode 66. He's a two-time Cine Eagle Award winner for the short films On Time and Writer's Block, 
and is currently executive producing a feature-length independent film, 79 Parts, directed by Ari Taub. Rob is also a graduate of the Odyssey Writers Workshop, and is currently working on an urban fantasy novel titled Divinity Bind. So Rob, welcome to the show. Hello, my subjects. All right, and so uh, the first thing I want to talk about is just, you know, what were the circumstances under which you saw this movie? Did you see it in 3D, stuff like that, overall feelings? And so, John, you were just telling me that you saw this movie in 4D, so why don't you start off and <laughs> tell us about that? Yeah, so apparently uh, there, the, the, the United States' only 4D theater is in L.A., um, and I guess there's only a couple of uh, other ones throughout the world. Uh, I think they were pioneered in Korea, but um, so 4D, obviously, you have to put it in quotes, but I mean, it's like, it's, so it's a 3D screen, but then the theater does some other stuff. So, like, for instance, the seats move around and stuff. So kind of like, uh, like if you've done Star Tours or something like that, where it's like a, so sort of like a virtual roller coaster type of thing. Um, it kind of feels like that, except that the seat's moving instead of the whole theater. Um, so it, it sort of does that, like when, when spaceships are banking around, you know, in fight scenes and all that kind of thing. Um, and also like it sort of sprays, uh, some mist on you occasionally, and there's some smells and stuff. And, um, and actually in Guardians of the Galaxy, when, uh, when Groot does his little trick with the lights, uh, with the little sort of firefly thingies, uh, when they're, when they're in the dark, uh, they actually had a bunch of bubbles fall from the ceiling to sort of help try to enhance oh, the wow. effect. Oh, huh. wow. Yeah. Wow. So wait, what sort of smells did they have? Uh, they basically had one smell. <laughs> I think they, ha I think they could use a little bit more work in that department. Um, I, I don't know what the smell is or what it's supposed to be. Um, it kind of was like, uh, I think it was basically like, you know, like laser gun. It was supposed to be like sort of laser gun smell. <laughs> um, so like it was sort of like a sort of burnt kind of like electronic sort of odor. I, I don't know what the heck it was, but it was awful. Um, not like, not like you're gagging or anything, but it was like, it wasn't a good smell. <laughs> and I think they, uh, they could definitely, um, they could definitely come up with some additional smells to, to, to sort of vary it up a bit. I mean, I was joking before I went to it. I was like, I'm not sure that I want to smell Rocket Raccoon because it doesn't <laughs> seem like he would smell very good. But, um, but, uh, so luckily we didn't have to, but, um, the smells that they did provide us with, uh, weren't the best. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll say I saw this, uh, in, in a real IMAX screen in Manhattan, uh, in 3D and... Yay. I, for, for complicated reasons, I ended up having to go to the 9 a.m. show, which was really nice because there were only about 20 people in the theater. So I didn't have to sit next to anyone else. Nobody distracted me or anything. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a gorgeous movie in IMAX, but I didn't know that the 3D added a lot to it, honestly. Um, what did you guys think, uh, Rob and Matt? Uh, what kind of shows did you see? Uh, I saw it uh, opening, night, I guess, well, the Friday that it came out with... Uh... Uh, my wife and friend and we uh we had a good time you know it was a, a big IMAX screening with 3D um you know I wear glasses and it's always annoying to have to um go to a 3D movie with my glasses on because I end up getting this sort of like weird distortion effect between the two sets of of lenses um which can kind of kind I don't know distract from the movie experience I don't know if other glasses wearing people have experienced this phenomenon um, but they should stage a protest. Um, <laughs> but it was, you know, it was fun. Yeah. How about Rob? What was your experience like? Well, I am actively avoiding the 3D uh, experience. Um, it's just, uh, just has not, it's been more of a distraction for me. And considering how much extra you pay for the so-called experience, I just don't feel that it's a very good value. And so I just try to find the largest 2D screen with the most, you know, sophist sophisticated uh, sound system. Uh, so in my local theater, they do have IMAX 3D, but it's faux IMAX. It's not real IMAX at all, um, which is another discussion. Um, so I just went to the, um, the larger screen format uh, that they call RPX, which is really what they're trying to market is their sound system with RPX. It's a Regal Cinema thing. So uh, so I saw it on 2D, a slightly larger screen, and a ridiculously loud sound system. I mean, actually, I actually avoid 3D when I can, but there are no non-3D IMAX prints of this movie, I think. So if you want to see IMAX, you have to go 3D. Um, but nevertheless, I absolutely love this movie. I laughed out loud through the whole thing. I cried pretty much for, for a lot of it. Um, 
what do you uh i i think i heard all you guys actually i don't think i've heard what matt thought did you did you like this movie oh a twist um it was fine you know i'm sort of getting to a point where i feel like this is the new standard and so you know people are accepting you know pretty generic uh plots and you know pretty stock characters as as like you know, because so many movies are bad, something that's passable on all, you know, each box got checked. And so it was fine. Um, and it's better than a lot of the movies that I've seen lately. But, you know, it didn't, it didn't floor me or anything like that. Oh, uh, wow. I'm really, I'm surprised to hear you say that. I mean, I, I, I just had so much fun watching it that, that just sort of, uh, you know, made it, made it so much better as an experience in my mind than so many other movies that I've seen um, in theaters, which may have better plots, may have better, you know, may have better acting and, and writing and whatnot. But um, yeah, I mean, I just, and, and I, I didn't, I didn't know anything about the guardians of the galaxy, actually. Um, you know, the, the title, I guess, was sort of on hiatus during the time when I was mostly reading comics. And then uh, the movie itself is actually based on a, a, a sort of reboot of it, uh, which which started in 2008, um, which I was not familiar with. Um, so I didn't have any attachment to them, although I did know Gamora and Drax um, and Thanos, of course, from from comics because they had been in other comics. But um, but, you know, I so I, I went into it without really having any attachments. Uh, but uh, yeah, I just I mean, I just I loved it. Yeah, well, I, I mean, you know, I'll tell uh, here are some of the things that I really liked about it. I really dug the opening sequence where it felt like Star Wars and Indiana Jones at the same time. I thought that was really cool. There were some really great stylistic things in it. And, you know, Wait, Matt, when, you, when like you a... say the opening sequence, you don't mean when his mom's dying oh, of cancer. Oh, I'm you? sorry. No, no, no. Yeah. the I guess it's is it the opening credits is when he's sort of making his approach into the this sort of like cavern or tomb or whatever that has his MacGuffin in it. Um yeah, no, the 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 sob story prologue I could have probably done without. Oh no way, that was great. Uh, okay, well I did like see I I did like seeing uh what's his name um Greg Henry he that's cool. I mean that was one of the the another thing that I really liked about it is that you know as a director James Gunn kind of has his troop of actors and it was nice to see a lot of them like Greg Henry and Michael Rooker. Nathan was Filler sorry was that the grand was that the grandfather? Yeah, the grandfather. Um. And then, uh, you know, Michael Rooker, who played uh, Yondu. And, um, yeah, like, it was nice to see his sort of troop show up in a huge budget uh, Marvel movie. I thought that was really cool. But, yeah, so so that was a really great sequence. I really liked seeing just, like, a straight-up space opera movie. I hadn't seen a movie like that in a long, long time that wasn't, you know, cribbed from some old serial, like, you know, uh, Star Trek, right? Um, so it was nice to, it was, it was really nice to kind of get that experience. Um, yeah, I, no, there, like I said, there were a lot of things that I really liked about it and it was funny. I laughed the whole way through too, but you know, so let's talk about all the awesome things about it and then, you know, well, I'll kind of get my whole, I actually have a question for you, Matt. Um, what, is it a movie that you'd like to see again? Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't pay to see the movie again, but if it's, uh, you know, if it's on DVD and people want to put it on while we're doing something else, I would totally sit through it again. <laughs> what was it? What was it about the prologue, the uh, opening, the very, very opening sequence, the prologue that uh, you found ineffective or or distracting or annoying? Uh, I don't know if I would say any of those things about it. If I did already, I, I'll take it back. Um but yeah, it just, it didn't, like, it's nice. Okay, it's nice. It's not nice, but it's like, okay, this is, we're, this is our attempt to humanize this character who we're going to meet in a little bit. You know, kids are likable. Um, kid, you know, orphans are sympathetic. That's fine. It, but again, it's all going back to, like, hitting those same beats and pushing those same buttons to create, you know, a really derivative uh narrative that's interesting because i i thought that the opening sequence you know the mother death scene was really more about establishing the deeper meaning of the use of the pop music references throughout throughout the film i thought the i mean yes you know you did have your generic sort of uh death scene opening sequence movie but this movie sort of revels in the fact that it has generic tropes and and generic archetypes and sort of 
uh, has fun with it. Yeah, and I don't think when I saw the trailer for this movie, I would have necessarily expected it was going to open with a mom dying in a hospital room of cancer, right? Right. Um, and John, I mean, I thought it was interesting how much you liked this movie, considering that you were really lukewarm on the trailer. Um, yeah. Was it a lot different than you were expecting from the trailer? Yeah, you know, I don't know. I mean, um, I guess I just, it took me a while to warm up to the what they were doing with the trailer. And like, I mean, mostly what I didn't like about the trailer was the the Uka Chaka you know, song, like, <laughs> sort of, you know, it's like, I, I don't know, there was something about that that just seemed like almost too ridiculous to me. But um, yeah, I mean, in retrospect, having seen the movie, the trailer was kind of perfect. I mean, it's just like, yeah, it, to me, it was mostly it was mostly a reaction to that. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I really love the way, um, you know, they, they sort of tease the movie without showing us all of the cool stuff in it. You know, it's like they did a good job of, like, introducing us to all these characters, which I think was important because nobody knows who they are, you know, because like we were saying, it, this is not one of the major Marvel properties that, like, Captain America or the Avengers, where people will be like, oh, yeah, I know those guys. Nobody knows who the Guardians of the Galaxy are. I, that's, um, that's, so I thought that was cool. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, I had no intention of seeing this movie at all. When I heard that Marvel was coming out with the Guardians of the Galaxy movie, I was just like, so what? You know? And wait, so Rob, did you know that had you ever read Guardians of the Galaxy? No, never even heard of them. Never yeah. even heard of them. And I was like, wow. So they're really they must be desperate pulling from like old inventory, you know, stuff. And I, I, I had really no, you know, my my reaction was really actually um, initially just cynical. You know, I just figured that, look, Disney just acquired, you know, Marvel and Marvel had already made a lot of distribution deals with other studios and so disney was trying to pull you know f deep into inventory so they could actually uh you know uh not have to share any of the profits with the with the other studios that marvel had made previous deals with so that was sort of my sort of uh you know cynical response and i didn't get interested until i actually saw the trailer uh when i saw the trailer and i saw Groot who was framed where his head was missing and he sort of he sort of like peeks below the frame to take a look you know to to so that you could see his face i was like oh that's that's kind of funny i i, I don't know the humor sort of resonated with me and 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 i was like oh okay i actually might want to see this one this might actually be fun whereas my girlfriend when she uh saw the trailer she was like oh great a talking raccoon gee just exactly what i want to see you know so it was funny how people responded you know to the trailer i responded positively with because my expectations were just i mean i was had no intention of seeing the movie at all yeah i, I responded positively to the trailer as well although then when watching the movie i found it really disconcerting because the movie didn't match the trailer mm -hmm. in what sense well drax wasn't in the lineup in the actual movie right. and then even if you go back and watch the trailer i don't think the the scene where they um where they catch him trying to grab the orb it doesn't look the same at all to me from what i remember from the movie yeah some of the some of the trailer is definitely different like they they i think they put drax in the lineup in the trailer because they were trying to introduce the team to to people because nobody knows who they are um and i thought that was fine and like yeah some of the some of the other sequences are a little bit off like where where the one guy says uh what a bunch of a-holes or whatever yeah. like like that, that's different in the trailer than how you actually see it in the movie um, but I was going to say, actually, uh, sort of what Rob was saying uh, about uh, what the what your thoughts about Marvel making this movie were like, I kind of almost had like the opposite sort of view, like not that not that cynical, like, oh, they were dredging up something, you know, from the vault to, to just throw out there. I was thinking it more like they were like, you know what? We're Marvel. We can do whatever the fuck we want. We're going to take this crazy ass galactic you know, team of misfits that nobody knows who they are. We're going to make a big movie out of it and people are going to go see it, you know? And then it's like throwing the, the gauntlet down to DC be like, what up? You know? <laughs> yeah, can, can you make a talking raccoon into a hit movie? Yeah. Uh, well, Matt, like, what do you, th have you, you said you did some research on this. Did you, do you, can you give us some perspective here? Uh, you mean as it, as it relates to the, Marvel Universe as a whole. Like, how did this movie get made? Do you have any idea? Yeah, so I think, so, I don't know, I don't know for sure, um, but I suspect that this is part of a, you know, a large Marvel strategy um, to tell the Infinity Gauntlet saga. 
um, which is a huge classic Marvel tale, which spans a bunch of, you know, limited issue trades with crossovers with all of the major heroes. Um, and, you know, there it a lot of it takes place in this sort of like the Marvel's galactic uh, world, right, which involves... Uh, Silver Surfer and Galactus, the Celestials, all of these weird cosmic beings. Um, and then it also, but, but then it's connected to, uh, the Fantastic Four because of the end zone and all of their, um, sort of, you know, Doctor Strange oriented, uh, plot lines, which then through the Fantastic Four connects to Spider Man. And then the other end of it through Thor connects to all the Avengers. So it's a way that it's the sort of Thanos uh saga is a way to connect every single property in the marvel canon okay wait for for people who don't read comics that much could you just give us like the the short synopsis of the infinity gauntlet oh wait 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 oh wait wait can i please (laughs) can i the infinity gauntlet is my jam okay go go take take it away okay so and i actually reread the entire infinity gauntlet like i mean six issues but i read (laughs) i read it in preparation for this panel okay so Basically, the Infinity Gems, or as they're called in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the Infinity Stones, uh, there, are, there are these six, like, stones that have these, like, like almost magical abilities. Like, so there's the Soul Gem and the Power Gem and all these things. And they all, they all like, do these, like, they give the person, like, these sort of uh, godlike powers. And so Thanos goes about and he collects them all and he, you know, puts them into this gauntlet. And then, like, once he has them all, he's basically omnipotent. And so Thanos is doing all of this in order to, because he's courting death. Um, and when I say death, I mean like the actual personification of death, like the character death in the Marvel universe, she's sort of like the goddess of death or whatever. And so he's like sort of courting her and to try to impress her, um, he decides he's going to like exterminate half of the sentient life in the universe. Wait, wait, wait and a second. So, wait a second. Wait. He's got a crush on death. On death. And yeah. This is why he wants to kill all these, what, sentient beings? Right. Right, and well, because death actually communicates that there's an imbalance in the universe, that there's too many people, basically, and, and that uh, too many of them are on the living side of the divide, you know? Oh, and I so, see. And, and so Thanos, in order to please her, he decides he's going to exterminate half the life in the galaxy, uh, or the universe. Um, and so, so he, he, to do this, he, get, he, does the infi- he goes and, get, and assembles the Infinity Gauntlet. Um, and so actually, if you guys, if anybody wants to like get some research on the Infinity Gauntlet and the Infinity Stones and all that... So there's a there's a Silver Surfer graphic novel called the the Rebirth of Thanos and that sort of sets the stage and then there's a, a two issue mini series called Thanos Quest um and you can get all this on Marvel Unlimited through the digital app if if you haven't you know got gotten them already but um in in, in paper um so you and then Thanos Quest that shows him actually going and getting all the individual Infinity Gems um and then um then there's the Infinity Gauntlet mini series itself um. Uh, and which, you know, shows, uh, the, the entire, uh, struggle, uh, against Thanos. Um, but the kind of crazy thing is that, so all of that's available to read, but as Matt was saying, the Infinity Gauntlet's this big Marvel spanning, uh, crossover event. So like there were, like when I was reading it as they were coming out at the time, back in the day, you know, all of these comics had, uh, crossovers and they were branded like, you know, Infinity Gauntlet crossover. So, but none of those were collected. So, like, if you just read the six issues, you're kind of missing a bunch of the story. So that's a little frustrating for me that you can't actually go and revisit that easily. But, uh, but there is, but there is all that. And if you want to get a background on the Infinity stuff, uh, that's a good place to start. And the Infinity Gauntlet is, like I said, it's my jam. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and like, as, as you guys are alluding to, I mean, there's a ton of backstory behind this movie. On, uh, and connections to other things. Do you think that this is, it's going to get confusing for people with no prior familiarity for this? I mean, I thought it was really interesting in this movie how they just throw you into the, the Xandar and the Scree, which I was not really familiar with. And, and they don't, they don't, it's not like, you know, it's not idiot proof. You know, you, you really have to be paying attention to follow all this stuff in this movie. That was one of the things that I really liked about it, actually, yeah. is that they, that, that they were just like, ah, you know, here's the thing they're all chasing. Here are the two alien forces at, at, you know, at war. Who cares? It doesn't matter what the intricacies of the plot are. You know, it's like that, was, like that was one of the things that I think, for example, the Star Wars prequels did really poorly, which was throw you into this, like, bureaucratic conflict and then you, explaining everyone's motivations in it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't care. It's like, look, there are the people that you know, are in metal boxes with bad lighting. And then there are people that are living in Dragon Ball Z village on this planet and they're at war. Okay. That's it. That's all you need to know. 
to uh to, to sort of get a handle on the plot because that doesn't really it doesn't really matter you know what the forces are at at work here what matters is these this small group of characters and how they all interact with one another yeah actually i totally love that as well that they just threw you right in there because i'm so sick of of these big sci-fi movies starting with this like this really uh basically a montage of like news or or whatever like you know edge of tomorrow i thought was great but it starts with that same kind of thing where it's like hey here's a bunch of exposition right the start of the movie to like set the stage it's like you know what guys we can figure it out it's like none of that stuff is really important in most of these cases and um and it's like just movie after movie you know they do that and it's just like you could just cut like the first five or ten minutes of almost every science fiction movie that's made uh because they just do all that um, and I just, I really appreciate just being thrown into it like that because yeah, it's like, you know, it doesn't, most of this stuff doesn't matter that much and you'll pick up what you need to pick up. Yeah. And I think we're at a point where audiences are familiar enough with all this stuff. You know, the basic ideas of science fiction, because we've seen all these other movies before. I've heard a lot of people comparing this movie to Star Wars or to the Star Trek reboot. Uh, I got a strong Fifth Element vibe from, you know, both the movie and the trailer. Um, how about Rob? What did you, uh, what do you think this, where do you think this movie kind of fits in, in terms of science fiction movies we've seen before did you just say the fifth element yeah yeah um i find i found it i didn't like the fifth element at all it it, it didn't work for me at all it, it, um so i mean i think it's 10 times better than the fifth element <laughs> but, well it's like the humor in the fifth i mean actually i didn't like the fifth element the first time i saw it and then the more i watched it the more i liked it but the humor in that is is like way out in left field and this is kind of like third base or something right i mean it's like it's right. sort of in that direction but it's taking it nowhere near as far yeah um like is this the new i've heard a lot of people say this is the new star wars for a new generation what do you think about that well if it is i think it's a damn good start yeah you you know actually it's it's really interesting because like uh, i don't know if you guys saw that somebody did like a youtube fan trailer of uh mashing up star wars with the guardians of the galaxy trailer uh sort of like the vibe of it so like they basically they took all these scenes from star wars and they played like the music from guardians of the galaxy trailer and they introduced the characters in star wars the same way that they were introduced in guardians of the galaxy and it just it was like perfect it was like really fun and it's like and so it really helped sort of contrast the two franchises and be like okay well you know there's a lot of similarities obviously but guardians of the galaxy does what star wars did but like is like just super fun and doesn't take itself so seriously yeah well that's what star wars the original the you know 19 what, what was it 1977 uh the original star wars the original star wars if you rewatch it it doesn't take itself that seriously uh so in that vein yes i mean they're they're a perfect match for one another I think one thing that's really interesting is if you take the original Star Wars movies and then go to the prequels, it's kind of like they took Star Wars and made everyone into a Jedi and politician, which doesn't work. Right, right. And Guardians of the Galaxy is like they took the original Star Wars movies and made everyone into Han Solo, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, there's... Uh, the, the Who's the most whiny character in Guardians of the Galaxy? Um... If you had to, if you had to say there was a whiny character, who would you pin it on? I mean, probably um, the main character, Peter Quill, I would say. Or I would. I or would oh no, maybe Drax. Uh, maybe, maybe Rocket. Yeah, I think Rocket. Yeah, I think Rocket. But even then, it's you know, everyone's silence is a sign that there is just no whiny, annoying character right. in the movie. Right. 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 That's exactly. A, that's a thing in its favor. Right, because in when you rewatch Star Wars, the whiny character is obviously Luke. I mean, it's like, right. you know, he sticks out like a sore thumb in terms of how whiny he is. Um, but Rocket, a talking raccoon who, you know, um, who I would pin as the closest to a whiny character, I, I actually loved Rocket. And I loved the way he whined because he was irreverent. He was the most irreverent character there. I mean, he, here you have Peter Quill saying, you know, Look, we got to stop these guys. They're going to, this guy's going to destroy the galaxy. And Rocket's like, oh, what does the galaxy owe you? Who cares? <laughs> you know? I thought Rocket totally stole the show, which I think is really a feat for a CGI character, which I ordinarily can't stand. Right. Well, I, I think Root, uh, Groot, sorry, Groot uh, was completely CGI too. And uh, he stole my heart. When he when when he died, quote unquote, died at the end, I was moved. I was a tear 
A tear ran down my cheek. Multiple tears over here. Yeah, yeah. You know, he what a great character, and and you know, I uh, I. I don't like I said I don't really know that character, um, but like I I did a little bit of research and it seems like he actually could speak regularly at least in in, in other comics. Like at least I saw one cover of a comic where he was saying you know a whole sentence. Uh, so it's like maybe he's not true to that original character, but like I don't care. Like I love this group. Like this yeah. group was amazing. Yeah, he, he was great. He was great. I, I read that Vin Diesel was actually he he sat down with James Gunn and he actually had James Gunn tell him what each each I am Groot is supposed to mean mm -hmm. so that he could try to say it in a way that would convey the, the sort of nuance of what Groot is actually trying to say. Right, um, right. Oh, and actually there's another comparison to Star Wars where uh, Rocket seems to sort of understand what Groot is saying, even though he's just saying nonsense, whereas, like, you know, uh, uh, Han Solo knows what Chewbacca's saying, even right. though he's just growling. <laughs> right, right, right. So yeah. it's kind of like that. And Rocket, too, like, when you see he has all these sort of... Um implants in his back and he talks about how he how he doesn't want people to think of him as this monster i mean i was really i i love that little raccoon you know i mean it wasn't just that he was funny i, I actually like liked him too yeah yeah no he you did uh end up creating sympathy for him uh but i i found his irreverence refreshing um and uh and his smart aleckiness you know like the part where he's like oh, he's like all right we're all standing up now standing up like a bunch of jackasses, <laughs> like jackasses. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> i love that dave uh you ha i really liked your question about where the movie fits in because the comparison that i kept drawing it to actually as i was watching was um to the princess bride which i think is a really good comparison because it you know it's a bunch of heroes that hate each other that start as enemies that have to sort of band together to take on a, a more powerful evil. Yeah, well, and, and like Drax is kind of like Enigma Montoya, and Groot uh -huh. is kind of like all, Andre the Giant. They all start out trying to, you know, kidnap each other and fight each other and and uh, and betray each other. But, you know, they're brought together. And so, but I don't know, I felt like there wasn't enough of the movie dedicated to that part of the story. Um, that was one of the things that I found disappointing, was that they... The characters seem to be interacting in a more interesting way before they all teamed up. And I, I agree that for a bunch stuff. of space pirates, they formed a team <laughs> pretty quickly. Yeah. You know, pretty yeah. quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, an Infinity Stone will do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So actually, can I bring up something else about the Infinity Gauntlet? Yeah. Go about on. the about the future uh, of where this might be going? Because yeah, like 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 Matt was saying, I, I also uh, discovered that. Uh, Kevin Feige apparently has either said flat out or insinuated that the plot of Avengers 3 will be revolving around the Infinity Gauntlet. And I was just like, my mind was like blown. I was like, I mean, even even though I've seen Thanos, I saw Thanos in the glimpse, you know, and they did the, the scene after the credits in whatever movie that was, you know, you saw San Thanos for a minute and then Thanos is in this. I'm like, I never thought I would see Thanos in a movie at all. I mean, honestly. Uh, but, you know, even with all that, I didn't really think they would actually do the Infinity Gauntlet. Uh, and so just the thought of that is like kind of crazy. It, well, and, and so I was like looking into it some more and like, I know I had heard people talking about the Infinity Gauntlet in Odin's, uh, treasure room in Thor. And so actually, yeah, like you act, you can actually see the Infinity Gauntlet in there. So I'm like, I'm a little confused how that's going to work, but, um, I'm just, I'm super excited about that. Uh, but so one other thing, one other background thing though, is like, so the Tesseract is actually called the Cosmic Cube in the comics. And that's actually, that was what Thanos used the first time to try to, you know, get ultimate power. Um, and so like, he's done this several times. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, so, and, and the thing is, it's like, it, one, one of the things I think really makes him a compelling villain is that he, um, it's like he, he, it's, he almost has this sense that he doesn't deserve it. And so he sets up his own, uh, demise. Um, and that, and because the thing is, is he, he's grabbing ultimate power in most of these cases. And so like, he, it almost has to do that in order to give the, the, the heroes any chance to defeat him. Is anyone else concerned about how these different franchises are going to mesh? Because the tone of this movie just seems so different to me than the tone of Captain America Winter Soldier. It just, like, I can't imagine Rocket Raccoon showing up in Winter Soldier. And so I'm just a little bit concerned about when all these characters start coming together, well, I how think, it's going to work. I think the visual tone and the, uh, and the, uh, um, and the narrative tone um, fits pretty well with the Avengers. I, I agree that it doesn't fit well with um with captain america or the single franchise but when they combine them with the, you know with the avengers uh i don't see much of a uh 
of a disconnect there. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because that's one of the things that Marvel has done in the comics uh, for a long time is, is meshed these weird, wacky things with the with their normal serious stuff. Like, um, like even in the Infinity Gauntlet and and with that in this in that Silver Surfer graphic novel I mentioned, um, you know, one of the one of the comics in that collection is basically has the Silver Surfer interacting with this guy called the Impossible Man, who's just like a completely ridiculous character. And I mean, I kind of wish that wasn't in there, to be honest. But I mean, they they have done stuff like that numerous times in the comics, and and it usually works. Um, and I mean, like you know, some somebody like Thanos, who's super serious and dark, and like you know, trying to take over the universe all the time. He's he's had lots of interactions with uh with characters that are sort of silly and everything. So it's um, th- there's even a Christmas story. There's a Christmas story with Thanos in this graphic novel. Um, so you know. Uh, who, it, who's to it, say if it's going to work is, in, the, in the movies? Is it worthy to make a movie out of this Christmas story? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no, it's not even really worth reading it. You can skip that one. <laughs> no, but I mean, I think Captain America, whose movies, I think, are very different than the Avengers, per se. The tone is very different. Um, I, thought, I think Captain America fit very well in the Avengers uh, movie. I mean, Dave, didn't you think Captain America fit well in, in the Avengers movie itself? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's more the Rocket Raccoon Captain America yeah. crossover I have I concerns see, about. I see. Yeah, um, I, I don't know. I don't. I have an easier time thinking of them blending together if it's an Avengers movie. If they were to, if Guardians were to suddenly poke in on a Captain America universe story, you know. A, you know, a sole Captain America story. I have a hard time seeing that. But but as long as it's the Avengers with the tone that Joss Whedon established, the visual tone, the narrative tone that he established with the Avengers movie itself, I don't have trouble seeing them blend. So wait, wait, John. So in the comics, if there's all this stuff going on in outer space, does like Iron Man know about that? And could Peter Quill just fly to Earth and pick up more songs and stuff like that? <laughs> uh, Well... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, you mean like during the Infinity Gauntlet or? Like in this Guardians of the Galaxy, yeah. could Peter Quill just get in his ship and fly to oh, Earth? right. And it would be this, it would be present time, right? And could right, he just buy all the, yeah. could he just buy, get an iPod and could just get all the classic songs he wants? Yeah, that's a good point. Like, why doesn't he do that? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you know, he totally should be able to. I actually think that Iron Man joins the Guardians of the Galaxy in an upcoming uh, hmm. or recent uh, comic for Guardians of the Galaxy. So it's like I, I, it might be them seeding plot lines for future movies. Movies, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is, it's like even though this feels like a futuristic movie, um, you know, Marvel stuff has never actually been futuristic. Generally, like the main Marvel universe, like they've had all this crazy space stuff, like Silver Surfer and 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 all this all this stuff that takes place out in space. I, I mean, it's always just contemporary. Um, it's just that like everything else is like more super advanced than Earth is. So yeah, I mean, theoretically. Quill should be able to just go to Earth and get more songs, but uh, maybe maybe he's got a bounty on him or something, and he can't risk going to Earth, or I don't know. Who knows? Well, I, I think cassette tapes are, you know, obsolete, and Sony Walkman is obsolete, and he wants to keep his Sony Walkman and his cassettes, so... No, I mean, he has strong sentimental reasons for wanting to hang on to that Walkman. I was just wondering yeah, yeah. if he could get, if he just wanted more songs, if he could just go to Earth yeah. and get them. I bet he could, but I think he, he probably wouldn't want to, because he wants to just trust what his mom gave him Absolutely. and especially now that he has volume two peter quill is not <laughs> peter quill is not a sellout he's not going to get an ipod <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so somebody was somebody was saying well how did how did he um how did he keep how did he keep getting new batteries for that thing and i and i said well you know i assume that he he invented so you know somebody figured out some futuristic way or some you know fancy technology way of, of powering the walkman without uh um you know, without actual double A batteries. But the bigger question is, how is he going to, if, if the, if the tape unspools, how is he going to get it back into the case without a pencil? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, he, he apparently hooked up his like stereo to the spaceship. Yeah, so, I yeah. mean, he's apparently got pretty good mechanical tech, technical skills. Yeah. Well, he, handy. I mean, rocket is the gadget master. So if anyone could, right. if anyone can solve that, problem, true, it's, true. it's rocket. Although, uh, Quill had already solved it by the time he even met Rocket. That's like. true. So, That's like they true. both got those skills. They're... Yeah, the mad skills, mad gadgets. Yeah, mad skills. skills. Yeah. See, John, you saw this movie twice, right? Did, was I it did. And was it different at all the second time? 
Uh, I don't think it was different. I I enjoyed it just as much. I think um, you know I saw it in the RPX 3D um, the second time around, and then basically like I didn't like I didn't like I wasn't like desperate to see it again, but like um, you know I went and saw it with my wife the first time, and then my sister in law uh, who lives with us she hadn't seen it yet, so um, so she didn't have to go by herself. I I went I went to see it with her um, the second time, and but I mean I I was very happy to see it again. I um, and uh, yeah, I mean it's. Uh, uh, I, I think I enjoyed it the second time maybe a little bit more because actually my one knock against the 4D theater was that I wish I had taken some Dramamine before I went to it because <laughs> just all of the movement and stuff, I wasn't really quite prepared for it. Um, and, and I felt a little nauseous, uh, you know, uh, part of the way through the movie. So, um, so I, I enjoyed, enjoyed it a little bit more the second time around because of that, uh, because of the lack of that. But, um, but yeah. Did you, did you, did you notice anything the second time that you hadn't noticed the first time? Um... I don't think so. Um, I mean, I think I, I, I was, I was watching, uh, I was watching scenes like the collector scene a little bit more closely to see if I could see anything else like in the background, but, um, I didn't really, um, I didn't really pick up anything just cause I was so like lost in the movie, you know? I, I heard somebody say that, I don't know if this is true or not, but I heard someone say that you can see a little bit of Howard the Duck in one of those oh. collector shots in the background if you know where, where to look. Oh no, that's crazy. I mean, you know, obviously he's in the, he's in the tag, uh, after the credits, but, um, you yeah, know, I didn't notice him. Yeah, what did you guys? Did what did you guys think of that? <laughs> I didn't. I thought it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hope. I, I hope that was just a silly joke that they threw in there, and they're not actually planning on bringing that back. Disney yeah, owns everything I'm now, sorry. so they I'm got sorry, it. I'm sorry because if 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 the Infinity Stone is with Howard the Duck, I I'm, <laughs> I just can't deal. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just yeah, can't yeah. deal. Uh, is there just anything like small details you guys noticed in the movie that you think people actually it was kind of funny because there are a lot of sort of 70s and 80s references in this movie. So like and in and, and that um, um, credit scene that Matt was talking about at the very beginning where he's walking through the it's the Indian, it's the um, Raiders of the Lost Ark kind of thing. There's a part where he slides across this sort of slime puddle. And someone mentioned that that's like the slide that Tom Cruise does in Risky Business. Oh. Right. Oh, right. Right. Um, and also his spaceship is called the Milano. I don't know if you guys caught that. So oh, no. it's like Alyssa, <laughs> Alyssa Milano. That's funny. You know, I love, I love that opening sequence though, that you guys were just talking about where, where you know, he's walking on the planet and he, he like grabs that lizard and he starts singing into it. And stuff. It's like, <laughs> yeah, that was hilarious. <laughs> Although someone was pointing out that, I mean, in the very first scene when he's a little kid, he, he says how he got into a fight protecting a little frog. And then, oh yeah, right. And then he's kicking. and then the very next scene, he's like <laughs> he's just like casually kicking small lizard things out of the out of his way. Well, aren't they like right. flesh eating lizards that are trying to eat him? Like they look. Yeah, they like, are. That that's a fair so point. Yeah, <laughs> self defense <laughs> frog kicking. He seems to be kind of enjoying it though. Yeah, yeah I mean, he's using one as a microphone. So it's... <laughs> yeah. Well, he grew up and he became a little bit of a dick, you know. So. Yeah, he was raised by by space pirates. Yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, he was, you know, I was, he was I, raised by Michael Rooker. I mean, what do you? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I, I was going to say, actually, you know, when Matt was sort of complaining about the the sort of generic nature of the the op the actual opening sequence with the mother and everything, um, I, I was thinking how it kind of subverted the whole thing because it's like, okay, so you have a character who who just loses his mother to cancer, but then he gets abducted by aliens, you know. So it's like the end of that sequence, like, kind of subverts the expectation of like what that movie would have been like right at the start, you know, because it's like, okay, so first of all, we didn't expect it to start with that in the first place, but then once we're into the scene and then it ends and it's like he just walks outside and gets abducted by aliens, it's like you didn't really expect that to happen. So yeah, that that felt that was extremely cool. arbitrary to me, and I didn't like it at first. First, and of course, until it was explained at the end, then I was like, oh, uh -huh. you know. Yeah. No, I actually liked the way it was kind of arbitrary and out of nowhere. Um, but then and then when they explained it, I thought that was cool, too, though. So, well, let's say, well, what do you what do you mean by it was explained at the end? Oh, well, because, um, you know, they start talking and they and it's like uh, his dad had sent them to go pick him up or whatever. So. Right. And they decided not to give him to his dad. They decided to keep yeah. him. Yeah. So so uh, who do you think his dad is? Yeah, I have no idea. I think. Do you, do you think you know? I I don't I don't know. I don't have any actual knowledge, and I don't have any guesses. I so think go, go for it. I think it's Adam Warlock. That's my theory. What? Yeah. Oh, why? Well, I don't. Uh, that would be weird. Because well, wait, Matt, you want to explain that? Sure. So, well, for one thing, Adam Warlock is a member of the Guardians of the Galaxy in the comic. He plays yeah. a very important role in the Infinity Saga. Yeah. And um, and at the very beginning, the mother, as she's dying, is describing the father to young Peter and says, he was a being of pure light. So it has to be some sort of important cosmic entity. My guess 
That's my guess. Right. But it could be, you know, one of the Celestials or, you know, some other being of great importance. Although I can't imagine that a Celestial would employ Michael Rooker to go fetch (laughs) fetch his, his progeny. Yeah, I can't, I can't actually picture Adam Warlock doing that either. And, oh, that's an interesting idea, but, um, he also, like, he's never, uh, seemed to be, uh, uh, like a sexual being whatsoever. Like, he's, like, you know, he's so, yeah, like, I, I just, I, I would find it really hard, hard to imagine him actually having a relationship with a human character. But, um, yeah, it's an interesting idea, though. Okay, well, Matt, wait, one theory I heard, okay, I gotta credit this to, um, Adam Murdo of the Comic Geek Speak podcast. But he was saying that there is that, um, you know, obviously, so, so it appears that some sort of alien came down and romanced uh, Quill's mother. And who would do that? And apparently in the comics, uh, Thanos has a brother named Eros, who is some sort of erotic god or love god. And, um, and, and that would kind of fit, right, with him doing that. And then Quill has, seems to have this kind of, like, he's sort of a ladies' man. So maybe he gets a little bit of that from his father. Yeah. It could also be Captain Marvel, Marvel. Because he's a Kree, right? He's part of that whole kind of cosmic Marvel storyline. Yeah. That also seems a little out of character just because he's so, like, noble and shit. Yeah. But, um, yeah. You know, that Eros is an interesting idea. I mean, I, I, you know, describing him as a being of pure light seems a little weird, you know, because, like, it, it kind of seems like she's saying that um, metaphorically, but, of course, she probably meant it actually literally. Um, so, like, if she actually meant it literally, like, you know, Eros doesn't have anything like that um, going for him. So, uh, but yeah, anyway, I mean, I don't know. It's, uh, who knows? I, I'd actually rather not actually find out until they reveal it in the movie or something. But, um, yeah, so so I, I haven't tried to try to figure out who it is. But yeah, I, probably, I expect we probably could. His father's probably Tony Stark. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess we should mention that he, he actually, in the comics, he does have a father, um, but it's not... It seems like they're probably going to do something different in the movie because it's not that interesting. Like the oh, way it's, okay. the way it's set up in the movie, um, if it, it's if it's revealed to be the person it is in the comics, it's it's just not that interesting. Okay, so speaking of Michael Rooker though, um, and Yondo, <laughs> uh, he's probably my least favorite part of the movie, actually. Um, so like I, I personally I could have used with like a hundred percent less uh, use of the word boy in dialogue because Michael Rooker says boy like a thousand times in the movie like he's calling everybody boy and like punctuating every sentence with boy. Um, Thanos even says calls uh, Ronan boy at some point and I was like no no <laughs> Thanos actually, actually Thanos. Th- Actually, Thanos says boy twice. So does he say it twice? <laughs> okay, he says Thanos it twice, should not... John. Twice. Thanos should not be Thanos should not be using that to call anybody boy. Okay, um, you know, but M- Michael Rooker, I just like, uh, like I get it that they did that on purpose, but I'm like, don't just take Merle from Walking Dead and put him in blue makeup and have him be the same character. Oh, but he's he's the same character. He's the same character uh, in everything he does. I know. I mean, well, don't like... hire him to be an alien then. <laughs> You know, like the uh, I just I, I didn't like I didn't that didn't work for me at all. Like you, I mean, you don't I guess, like you, know, you don't like hillbilly aliens, uh, uh, John. I mean, I guess it's possible some case that might work. It didn't work for me for that. That's he was by far my least favorite part of the movie. I thought um, his arrow was cool though. Yeah, his arrow was pretty cool. His arrow uh, was I mean, very like, cool. Yeah, like like um, but I mean, his character uh, was my only like real point of annoyance. Um, I think there are other flaws to it. Like if we, if you guys want to launch into that, we could do that. But I mean, like Michael Rooker in particular, just, I, I really didn't like his character. I didn't like him being cast in that role. I, I would have much rather they just had somebody who wasn't, you know, being Michael Rooker, uh, in that role. So. Uh, all right. Well, yeah. So why don't we get into like complaints people had about the movie? Um, I mean, my main, my main ones are just that, I mean, Matt already mentioned that the story of an evil leader trying to get his hands on a powerful artifact that allowed him to st- destroy the world is just kind of done to death, right? I, you know, I would like, I, I had no problem with it, but I would have liked to see something maybe more original. But what do you expect an evil, you know, leader to mm-hmm. do? I mean, it, that's what they, I mean, that's what, e- that's part of the definition of evil, isn't it? <laughs> no, but I'm saying, I, okay, Rob, wait, wait, bear with me for a second. Okay. You could have a movie without an evil leader. Ah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they could be doing something, you know, they could just be like trying to start a restaurant or something. I, I got <laughs> um, <laughs> But but I mean, know, but, but there's obviously a larger frame story, right? Which is the the stones, right? The infinity stones where yeah. I I think there are 3 or 4 that we know of, right? And yeah. So um and I don't know where they are, but but um but there's a larger frame story here and obviously you've got 
not just one MacGuffin, but six of them at least. And so they're all powerful. So, I mean, they're kind of tied to that, that trope. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying, though, Dave. Like, I mean, and I, and I appreciate what Rob's saying as well. Like, you know, I, I think, I think the Infinity, the Infinity Stones does kind of mitigate that a little bit. But that said, like, Ronan wasn't my favorite. Like, you know, he wasn't as strong as he could be. Um, especially with Thanos there in the background. It's like, oh, God, Thanos, he's an amazing villain. And I hope they don't screw up Thanos, like, whenever they actually give him some real screen time. But, um. Well, I thought he looked great. I mean, that was one oh, yeah, thing no, he that did. I really yeah. liked is that just the look of Thanos was spot on. You know, they, yeah. They do so many things to like modernize or update, um, you know, stuff in the Marvel movies. And it always bums me out because I'm just like, ugh, why does it, you know, like Galactus is not a cloud, right? And like all the, <laughs> well, that, all the X Men uniforms is, look like Donna Ma- Dominatrix clothes. clothes. Ugh, and it's like, horrible. right? And so yeah. it was really nice to be like, you look like you jumped off the page of a comic book that I Yeah, owned. that was awesome. Like, yeah. That was that very was awesome. cool. Yeah. I thought they did a really good job with his voice too, because it's like he, because like in the comics, you know, obviously his 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 words are written in in a in a sort of weird way, so it's to convey some sort of like otherworldly voice, and so it was cool to actually hear it uh, translated to screen. Um, but as far as uh, other things we didn't like goes, um, I could have used I could have done without um, Peter Quill being that sort of womanizer type character. Um, like Dave, you mentioned in the show notes that you sent us, you mentioned that you know. Uh, He's portrayed as, you know, not knowing the name of the woman that's on his ship with him and everything. And it's like, I, I actually kind of like that scene. I just wish that he didn't, like, not know her name. Like, if he if he had knew her name and he just had forgotten that she was still there, that would have been funny. And that would have been just as funny without him also being kind of a, an asshole who, you know, slept with some alien he picked up that he doesn't know even know her name, you know? Um, so I didn't like that. There's so, and there's a couple other things like that in the movie that I could have done without, like, like Drax calls Gamora a horror at some point for, like, no reason. Um, and that's, um, that's after, and, that's after he insults everyone else though. I mean, he's in the process of being, f- being generous to them. Right. I mean, in yeah. his mind, he's being generous, but he's being insulting to them at the same time. And he was just, right. it was after and, and, he called Groot a dumb tree. Right. Right. Well, that's, that's, that's really different though. Like, I think if you're going to, I mean, it, it just, it's just like, it's because there's like a pattern of just like misogyny throughout most movies, especially action movies. And so it just kind of brings it to the forefront is like, okay, well, like, look, does, did he have to make a gendered insult to her? And, and one is as nasty as that. Like, you know, I mean, that's like one of the worst things you can call a woman. So, um, you know, it's just like, it kind of stuck out to me as like, oh, okay, well, that was, you know, kind of upsetting for no reason. Um, and I expect a lot of people were actually really pissed off by that. So, um, it seems like. I don't you know. know. It just seemed consistent with Drax's character. I don't know. Mm. I, I mean, All right. I, it did bother me that Peter Quill didn't know who that woman was, couldn't remember her name. I thought that did not, that bothered me. That mm-hmm. bothered me. But Drax, a Colin Gamora whore, did not bother me because I thought that's exactly what he would do. Mm-hmm. I'm a little bit more with John on this one because I mean, just everything Drax said made me laugh out loud. You know, yeah. where he's like, "Nothing goes would go over my head. My reflexes are too fast." To catch <laughs> yeah. it. That was hilarious. And that, like, that, was that was the hilarious. one. That was the one line he had where I was kind of like, "Oh, I don't know. I don't know how yeah. I feel about that." Yeah, actually, uh, you know, so one one joke that I thought they missed uh, an opportunity for could have been like a little wink to the comics. Um, so like, if, if I don't know if you guys have actually seen what Drax looks like in the comics, he's like kind of like what he looks like in the movie, but he actually wears like this like big purple cape. Um, and I actually, what? and it's like, yeah, he wears this big purple cape and it has like the, the frill around the, you know, not a frill, but like it has like the back piece that sort of sticks up sort of like Dracula's, you know, <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know what you call that on a, on a cape, but you know, so, so he has that in the comics and, and there's this one part where they're all gearing up and they're all like, like Rocket's getting his, his weapons and everything. And, and, you know, Drax is putting his knives in his, in his boots and everything. Uh, I thought it would be funny. Like if he had found like a cape somewhere and like he came out with it and like presented it and, and uh, or, or at least like, uh, and so like, pe- so like the others could have made fun of him or like, he could have like thought about putting it on and then just like, like threw it down and like said, nah, you know, whatever, you know, I thought that would have been kind of a funny, uh, wink to the people who knew what Drax looks like in the comics. Yeah, I don't like that idea because I mean they kind of <laughs> did, they kind of did that in I forget which X Men movie it, where it was where oh, he's like yeah, what would yeah, you yeah. prefer yellow spandex I just I don't, I don't know I hate that stuff okay yeah 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 I mean maybe it's better they left it out I'll tell you something for me is I am completely done with prison breaks in sci fi movies 
Uh, this was one of the big things for me that really kind of bothered me about the movie. Is it's just like we like we just a couple months ago there was a prison break scene in a Marvel movie, like in the new X Men movie. It's like, are we? Is this the only thing that we can do as our second act? Like, it's so boring and like tedious. It, like, I've just seen it so many times now that there's but I nothing. Loved how, I loved how it was triggered, though. I mean, they're planning it. They have no intention of leaving now. And then Groot just sort of goes, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> and just kind of walks over and grabs whatever device, whatever that was. But Yeah, they did it and they did it in the way that the characters in this movie would do it. But it's right. like, it's this set piece that is so overdone, um, you know, going back a long, long way. And I don't know, I just, I wish they could do something else with, with uh, the beginning of Act 2 of one of these movies. And then the other thing, sorry to get all like, uh, narrative structure on people, but um, we can as, handle it. As soon as as soon as they find the stone, I'm and realize that the stone is what it is. I'm like, okay, so now the bad guys are going to show up and they're going to have a huge action sequence. And 15 minutes from now, the bad guy, the good guys are going to get beaten down. The bad guys are going to get the stone, and all hope is going to be lost. Watch. <laughs> and then over the next 20 minutes, that's exactly what happened. And it's like everything is so completely predictable. And by the numbers, it's like we've seen this movie before. So I don't know. Like th that was the stuff for me that kind of um, I I found was a little lacking. Just like a, a, it's going to be a romantic subplot with Quill and Gamora. Oh yeah, of course there has to be, right? You know why doesn't she hook up with Rocket? That would be interesting. It's different, <laughs> you know. I don't know. It's it's funny what bothers you and what doesn't bother me. Like yeah. I mean, I I saw that coming, but I liked the way I liked why it happened. Uh, in terms of the bad guys showing up and taking the stone. Right. Like, I like the fact that it was Drax who actually called Ronin over there. Right. Drax, Drax, whose only superpower is to be kicked long distances. <laughs> right. right. I mean, I don't know. There was something about this movie when it was, when it was towards the end and I realized that I cared about the characters and I was like, I don't know quite how they did that because there's nothing pretty much but action in this movie. Okay, it's generic. It's narratively predictable. But how do they do, how do they deal with all this genericness? How do they deal with all this predictable narrative? But yet we still care about the characters. How do they do that? You know? And then I was like, well, maybe. They have each character do something that only that character would do. For instance, only Drax would call Ronin, right, to uh, exact, exact revenge at that time, you know, which would, of course, moves the plot forward. Uh, and, of course, makes you annoyed that the bad guys show up, you know, right there and then when you were expecting them to. But it was the reason why they showed up or, or how it was exacted that I... That I appreciated. I thought, oh, okay, that's that's pretty cool, you know. And so, um, and then also Groot taking that battery when they're in the prison. Like only that right. character would do that. Right. Exactly. Only Groot would do that, you know. Well, I did want to ask you, Matt, because I mean, you we mentioned that you did this web series, Space Pirates in Space, and Guardians of the Galaxy is kind of a space pirate movie as well. I was wondering if you do you see any similarities or differences? Like, do you think they face some of the same issues you faced when you were making your Space Pirates uh, show? Well, I mean, there is. It's not a. It's not a totally. You know, obviously, it's not. It's not an original idea conceived by me. Um, the sort of ragtag band of heroes, whether they're on a pirate ship or a spaceship. Um, it, you know, it's been done a lot of a lot of times before. My inspiration when I took on Space Pirates in Space was to create a group of total, you know, very disparate characters, each with their own unique set of uh, goals and objectives, and made sure that they were always trying to one up each other and and sort of go against each other, so that they're their own worst enemies all the way through the story. Um, you know, I found it a little bit convenient that the that the heroes in Guardians of the Galaxy were so quick to you know, abandon their original objectives and work together as a team. Um, but, you know, yeah, it was, but they, they, they managed to pull that off, I think. Um, you know, there's each, when you're building a hero team, there are, you know, there are a lot of tropes that you can either um, use to accentuate the story that you're telling or turn away from in order to 
create something fresh and interesting. A guy of my group, he was a giant, you know, uh, ooze monster. And my captain was more of an, much more of an idiot than, than Peter Quill is. Um, as usual, the, the woman is the smartest person on the team. Um, well, well, yeah, and also, I mean, Gamora is basically the girl on the team, right, right? Right, And can you imagine if there were four, if it was a five-person team, four women and one male character? I mean, that's, that's not something you see much. No, it's, it's not. And I, I, would love to see, I would love to see that story. Um, I think that would be really interesting and, and, you know, and fresh. I'm trying to think now of, like, if there are examples of that kind of thing. Um, but nothing certainly is jumping out uh, in mind. Oh, so I thought of one other thing to criticize the movie for, um, which I, I didn't pick up on when I first watched it, but I saw people talking about it afterward. And then when I saw it again, I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. Um, so, you know, it, another way in which the movie is like Star Wars is, is that there's apparently only one black person in the galaxy. Um, you know, it's like there's this one guy who's like on a ship who's like, I think he's with the um, with the Nova Corps or something that he's trying to capture them. Or maybe he was one of the prison guards. I can't remember. But there's this there's one guy who has like screen time and he actually talks to people. Um, and then, but then, and then there's like tons of aliens. There's all kinds of aliens all over the place, but then basically almost all of the humans are white. And so it's like, okay, well, that's kind of, they could have done better with that, certainly. Um, and maybe, maybe there were people in the background or something, but I mean, as far as like speaking, actual speaking roles, yeah, like all the, all the human looking people were white, except for that one guy. Right. And even hey, he least, was, Hey, at least he didn't die. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. He didn't. Yeah. Well, so at least as far as we know, a lot of people died in this movie. Yeah. I have to say. And so I, I saw people saying like, "Oh, well, I don't know if it's fair to characterize a movie as fun that in, in which so many people die." But you know, it's like, it's all kind of cartoonish, and it's like you know, uh, it is comic yeah. book. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I guess just the other last thing I wanted to mention in terms of criticism was that I thought this was extremely well executed for what it was. But what it was is basically a 1930s style pulp science fiction story where all the aliens look human and FTL is everywhere. And, you know, the aliens all speak English, apparently. Right. Um, and I just like, as I, as I came out of this movie, I was just kind of like, wow, I really liked that. But I would really like to see that level of special effects and character and just basic execution applied to something else, you know, something more right. ambitious on a science fictional level. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, that's the kind of thing that I hope to see um, in, like, you know, the sci-fi channels adapting the Expanse series by James Corey. Like, that's the kind of thing I'm hoping to see in there, like, where they put that sort of level of effort in, into the special effects and everything. I mean, obviously, it's a television show, so they can't quite match that. But, um, but that series uh, does have a lot of, uh, you know, opportunity to do really cool things like that. So hopefully, hopefully we can get to see something like that soon. And and also John Scalzi's uh, Old Man's War series also uh, was recently announced. Their Sci-Fi Channel is making that into a series. So that actually that actually is probably more of a relevant comparison to Guardians of the Galaxy because it um it's it's like a more serious version of that in, in a way because it's like it has uh, lots of aliens and stuff in it. And then of course we have uh, Christopher Nolan's Interstellar coming up, which hopefully will will do some of what you're looking for as well. Um, it's hard to tell from the trailer so far, but. Seems like there's a lot of time spent in the cornfield, a little bit too much for my for my liking. But uh, but you know, after Inception, I'll go see anything that he does. <laughs> well, yeah, but that's the thing with that trailer. I mean, it looks like a good movie, but the whole trailer. I don't know if the movie is going to be like this, but the whole trailer is basically about how much fathers love their kids, right? Which, which is cool. Like that's fine. But I mean, I, I wish there was more science fiction that explored different kinds of societies with different kinds of right. values than the ones that we have. And and that was another thing with Guardians of the Galaxy is like it all just seems like heterosexual monogamous couples and everything like you know there's and right. then the, the government looks just like our government i, I mean I, you know the army just looks like, looks like just like our army i mean just like the, one of the things about science fiction i like to see is that it can do completely different kinds of societies and st right. that shows up so seldom in film yeah i mean that's not the sort of thing that you're going to get out of a movie like guardians of the galaxy but yeah no, I, it, 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 <laughs> right. would, it would be cool it would be cool to see um and you know like if, if they were to adapt something like an ian banks novel or, or like ursula Le Guin or something like that like you know uh that that would be cool but um hopefully the success of something like guardians of the galaxy will inspire the filmmakers to be able to take other chances um hopefully that it's not just in that sort of zany uh you know sort of larger than life space opera type of thing and maybe they can try to do something a little bit more serious or, or you know like like you say that that sort of take science fiction and uh to more of the more of the extreme than what we're see more than what we've been seeing in film 
Yeah, I think if you're going to take advantage of something that Dave wants done, you know, I mean, Dave, I'm looking for that too, but I just don't think that's, I just don't think feature films are the, are the right canvas for that. I think TV probably would do better uh, with that kind of approach, doing, um, being able to really sort of flesh out the, uh, a real alien culture and, um, on a, on a, uh, um, space opera scope. Um, I mean, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong, but I, I just think, um, I just think what drives studios, of course, is is making the big bucks, and I just think that sort of they see that more as a niche type uh, story uh, approach. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree. But if they ever did want to make a big budget movie that was a little bit more conceptually ambitious i would be in totally in favor of that um what do you i mean at the end of this movie it says the guardians of the galaxy will return do you guys have any thoughts or uh desires for what's going to happen in the sequel no <laughs> <laughs> no i didn't put i have to admit i did not put much thought into that um well, they, will they care? Do you think, in, if they do a second one, that the characters will interact with any of the other Marvel characters, or is it going to be another standalone adventure? Or? Well, you know, uh, for what it's worth, like I, I don't know. Uh, like I said, I don't know the Guardians of the Galaxy comic, but I mean, I would actually love to see some of the other cosmic people from the Marvel universe. Because, like I said, I mean, Silver Surfer was like, I mean, well, I, I didn't actually say it. Silver Surfer was my favorite comic, you know, and, and all of that sort of related stuff was what I was most interested in, which is why I, I like the Infinity Gauntlet so much. Um, but yeah, I mean, it'd be really cool to see the Silver Surfer. Unfortunately, I don't know if he's tied up rights wise because of that Fantastic Four movie. Um, so I don't know if he can be in a Marvel Universe movie, uh, an MCU movie, I mean. So is that, know, that would be cool, but. Is the upcoming Fantastic Four movie, that's, that's separate from what's going on here, right? With the Marvel Cinematic Universe stuff with Thanos? I mean. Right. I think it's, it's that, it's Fox or whatever. It's Sony or Fox. Okay. I mean, there was one thing in this movie where uh, they go to a place called Nowhere. It's kind of like this pirate bay where it's, yeah. in, it's in, inside the head of some sort of decapitated celestial or something. That was uh -huh. really cool. I would have liked to see. I don't know. That, that just um, opened up yeah. possibilities in my mind for cool yeah. stuff. Yeah, that was really crazy. Like, I never would have expected that to actually stay in there because, like, that's a thing. I, I knew that was a thing from the comics. And it was like, who, who would have guessed that they would actually keep that? Um, but I was really glad that they didn't, like, spend a, a tedious amount of time, like, explaining what the hell it is or anything. You know, they just, oh, okay, that's what it is. Let's go with it. You know, yeah, yeah. it's like, keep up or get left behind. Um, but so, you know, actually, one thing that we haven't discussed that I'd like to at least throw out there is that I thought was cool was that, you know, this is actually the first Marvel cinema, uh, the, the first MCU movie that was actually written by a woman. Um, although it's it's actually co-written because James Gunn, like, rewrote the screenplay, apparently. But the first draft of this was actually written by a woman named Nicole Perlman. And, um, and apparently one of the reasons that it got made was that they, they, they hired her to, to adapt something, um, just as being, a, a sort of a talented screenwriter that they knew. Um, and they, they gave her her choice of like a bunch of different properties, sort of like the C-list type stuff that they didn't think was necessarily going to be like a big budget or, you know, a big movie. And so, uh, she picked Guardians of the Galaxy and people were kind of surprised or whatever. And then, but then she like knocked it out of the park with the, with the screenplay. So... You know, so, I mean, I just thought that was really cool. Um, and apparently James Gunn, like I said, he rewrote the script. Um, I assume he added all the micro, micro worker parts. Um, <laughs> but, uh, also, also I do have to give him props though, because I guess, I guess Groot was not in the first draft of the screenplay and, and, and Groot was amazing. Yeah. Although I could, in, in her defense, I could see why she may have left it out. Cause you'd be like, you know what? I want them to make this into a movie. If I put a giant sentient tree in there, it's probably not the best way to make it happen. It's bad enough. I already got a talking raccoon, you know? <laughs> Uh, so, but, but I'm glad Groot ended up in there, however it happened. Uh, all right, cool. So, uh, we're just about out of time here, so we should start wrapping this up. Um, I guess I did want to ask Matt, we mentioned that your first novel is coming out in about yeah. a month. You want to tell us about that? Sure. Um, so the book is called The Eighth Continent. Um, it's the story of brother and sister Rick and Evie Lane, who are trying to terraform the great Pacific garbage patch into a verdant eighth continent, uh, a new world where they can make their own rules. Um, so they, they have to race around the world uh, gathering ingredients and tools that they need 
to create uh, an Eden compound, which is a, a formula that their father, sort of a crazy inventor, uh, developed that can transform trash into uh, organic or sort of earth-like compounds. Um, it's a rip-roaring adventure story for kids. It sort of is set in an alternate present, is how I like to describe it. So it's set on Earth, and everything kind of feels contemporary, but there are some far-flung technologies that um, sort of spice up living on Earth, like hover ships and talking robots and all other kind of awesome stuff. And so what age, kids, is this aimed uh, at? It's and... targeted towards like 8 to 13. Um, I think 12 is probably the sweet spot for it. But, um, you know, I think that everyone, you know, I, I, I'm an adult. I wrote the book uh, and I wrote it, you know, to deliberately, you know, put in something that everyone will find entertaining. You know, it is cool to kind of have this wild adventure story, but also a lot of really interesting technologies. You know, some of the stuff like there's flying trees in the book and those are technologies that may not exist in the near future. But a lot of the stuff is actually inspired by real tech that's being developed or is um, out right now. Um, advanced robotics and terraforming. Um, and of course, the garbage patch itself is a, is a big, serious issue that, that needs to be addressed. So, um, I'm happy to, you know, use it as an excellent setting for raising awareness about pollution on Earth. Uh, isn't there another garbage patch in the Atlantic as well? There's a number of them actually in, in most of the Earth's oceans. What happens is, as uh, trash gets accumulated in, in ocean currents, they sort of get swept into these gyres that, are, that populate the, the Earth's oceans. There's several of them. So there's one in the Atlantic. There's a couple in the Pacific. Um, if you go online, you can look up, you know, sort of where a lot of them have been identified. It's hard to target exactly how many of the garbage patches there are and how big they are, um, because what happens is the trash is mostly plastic matter and the agitation of the of the ocean current and the salt water break it down into these tiny little particles of plastic called nurdles um which uh accumulate but because they're reflective because they're so small even with satellite imaging it's hard to detect um you know where these things are located and and how big they are um but but we suspect that some of them may be twice the size of texas and um and they're they're all over the place so, Matt, do you have an evil character that has to acquire a powerful device? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're, the funny you should ask. I don't think that any of the villains in my book are smart enough to figure all that out. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but my, you know, I, I'm very fond of my villain. She, um, she, she loves all things that are plastic and pink, and um, and is determined to uh, transform the garbage patch into New Miami. Um, a, a fun hot spot where uh, where people can go and spend lots of money. That's what matters to her. So she uh, she's not trying to take over the world. She's just trying to make it more the way she wants it to be. All right, cool. So I think we're gonna have to wrap things up there. Uh, but I, you know, certainly uh, we hope that you'll go check out Matt's book. His name is Matt London. The book is called The Eighth Continent. And of course, it's his first novel. We want it to do well because we want him to have the opportunity to write other books. So if you've enjoyed any of his 11 appearances here on Geek's Guide to the Galaxy, I hope you'll go check that out. And uh, otherwise, I think we're going to wrap things up there. So uh, Matt London and John Joseph Adams and Rob Bland, thanks so much for joining us as guest geeks. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dave. And that was our panel. So thanks again to all our guest geeks. And of course, big thanks again to Nick Harkaway for being our guest today. Big thanks as well to everyone who's given us five stars on iTunes, including Richard Burt, Poe to the Pulps, and Sci-Fi Irene. Sci-Fi Irene writes, I discovered Geek's Guide a few years ago when I was looking for interviews with George R.R. R. Martin. I loved the episode so much I decided to go back to episode one and listen to everything. Since I regularly get behind on podcasts, I find that listening to two or three episodes of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is incredibly refreshing and relaxing. David Barr Kirtley and John Joseph Adams are genuine geeks with extensive knowledge of the science fiction and fantasy genres. I cannot imagine the number of hours of research that these guys do to be so prepared for each author and each panel topic. They ask thought-provoking questions of their guests and engage their panel in lively discussions. As a result of this podcast, I am regularly adding books to my Goodreads to Read shelf. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is one of my favorite podcasts. Thank you for producing such an interesting show. So big thanks to Sci-Fi Irene for that great review. 
And of course, a huge thank you to all of our crowdfunders, including our newest crowdfunder, Michael Strickland, crowdfunder number 84. This episode was also made possible thanks to support from listeners such as Bruno Onkir, Jonathan Pottle, Kurt Donaldson, R. Chris Four, Scott Osterling, John Marshall, and Abigail Drake. So thanks, guys. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.